Valentine's Day. That's it. I got my pink shirt on. You do. That's for Valentine's Day. See, there's one major problem I have. I don't have anything red. Nothing? Not one thing red. Doesn't go with baby the, blue. I you know. I hate the color red. You played for the Braves and the Cardinals. I am well aware. They didn't give you red stuff? Yeah. You but I had it. to wear that. Did you trash it? Yeah. Donated it. Donated it. Donated. Yeah, I, oh. gave, it, I gave it okay. away. But yeah, no, I, it away. I do not have. I don't own one thing red. Hey, it's Valentine's Day. What did the Salute. salt say to the pepper on Valentine's Day? Uh, I, don't I don't know. Ooh, baby, baby. Ooh, baby, baby. I'm not laughing at the joke. I'm just laughing at Kratz singing. I, seriously, that's yeah. Kratz that's singing's good. fun. Yes, that's AJ good. has, and I have a matching drink today. Oh, that. A, <laughs> pink tea and we have a valentine's day card you know you're secure with yourself if you have that tea and if you sing ooh baby baby wait we have a card for you kratz only you get me this excited you can screenshot this if you'd like if you're watching right now or later and you want to give this to a special really? loved one you look super excited <laughs> for no, the I podcast agree. crowd super uh, duper excited. kratz is is in his Yankee face. Is that a fair way to put it? That is my every single day of photo day for 19 seasons. That was my picture. And the photographer would always say, smile. I'm like, look at the dudes that smile on their pictures that are on the scoreboard. On You know, you're going to put this picture on the Scranton Wilkesbury scoreboard all season long. And I'm going to be like this. No. So I just would give the... Give the people what they don't want. Yeah. Well, also, I think Kratz, you are nice. You've got dad jokes. You're you're a teddy bear. But the persona that you partially played at times was, I also can truck stick you if we get in a fight. <laughs> don't run into me, or I'll pick up two people each by the back of their neck, like a uh, mama picking up her puppies, and I will drop you in the dugout and maybe break your fingers as we're doing it. So is a so is a picture picture t says a thousand words I guess. Mm -hmm. I just really to didn't me, like that meant day. toughness. It wasn't my thing. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't want me there, and I didn't want to be there. So it well, was. You created Valentine's Day glory. I so. love that. That's it for love. Now that might be for a breakup hate. card. <laughs> you want a breakup card? How about fans with their uniforms? Let's charge the mound. And this is Oof. as much feedback as I've seen to my personal socials and to FT socials in a while. Fans are furious about the uniforms, the new jerseys that are being unveiled in spring training right now. I'll need help from you guys to evaluate what's going on here. Let's first show a little video that we have to help explain the story. I definitely feel faster. It? it feels more fit on your body and how light it is. It feels great. It's yeah. comfortable. Yeah, great fit. It looks good on everybody. It feels good. It's like, kind of like the NBA type of jerseys. Ooh. You know, so it's, it's cool. Do you feel the difference between this jersey and your regular game day jersey? I actually do. I'm a guy that I sweat a lot. Like usually when I'm pitching, like I have to change my jerseys twice, sometimes three times, like really? take one off, throw it in the dryer. I'm, oh, I'm sweating right now, but I can feel the jersey being a little more breathable. Wow. I have like I have this like lightweight feeling to it, and it's like really, really comfortable. You think about lighter being able to play? How does that impact your performance? Well, I think it's just you know for me that's a, I'm a slow guy. Uh, I need all the help I can get. So light cleats, light jersey, <laughs> light everything is better for me. So uh, maybe this will help me steal a couple more bats. I feel like it will. And now Miles Michaelis. <laughs> we are showing a picture of his jersey. Would you like to grade it? I mean, it, honestly, if you didn't know any better, it looks exactly the same. The number, the letters are a little bit smaller. The the Michaelis name, 
are a little bit smaller. But other than that, like honestly, if you didn't know, if you didn't, if you don't put up the last year versus this year, you really can't tell a difference from that picture. Well, Miles says they also don't fit right. Pants are no longer as customized. The fabric is a very different consistency. Another player said they look cheap. Well, they- fans are pissed. I mean, I got they- even just on, on my way here. I got a few more. Uh, DMs and they were like, you better talk about the jerseys. I was trying to buy player X and I can't even get it now because it's so bad. I'm, I'm not Trout a big jersey buyer things. guy. I'm, I'm a t-shirt guy, but I need help here. You guys tell me what's going on. AJ, what did your jersey look like when you first broke into the big leagues? Do you still yeah. have your original jersey? I have, there's one right over there that we can pull out. And then, you, and then you pick up my last one in 2020 when it's Nike they change. They change all the time. Like your first one, I bet, is more like a burlap sack. Oh, yeah. It is super thick. Yep. Su- like not wool, but like a polyester almost, like super thick. And then slowly but surely, they got lighter and lighter and lighter. And then the pants got lighter and lighter. They put like venting in certain areas in the pants to keep them lighter and make them easier to move around in. And you could get like different stuff. I, I mean, listen, there, there, there's a better kind of difference you can see the difference in the name that i have to admit the name looks better on the old ones to me yeah what did they do with the name they curved they curved everybody's name and i always felt like if your name was curved it was because you were tiny i don't like the curved names like the dudes that or you had a really long name like aj's but if like look at carlos zambrano's back zambrano was straight across if you put zambrano on my back it would be curved like the bigger dudes always had the straight across names. Now everybody's names curved. And I think they're forcing it. It just looks it looks tiny and like just screen printed on. And that's the problem. That's why people yeah. are pissed. Well, the other thing, well, my, my, here's a different one. Uh, you can see right there where his is like it's a straighter. Yeah, the left the does. The, the back of the jersey alone, just focusing on that for a moment and for the pod crowd later. We're looking at the Reds 2024 on the left versus the right. I am an Ellie De La Cruz specialist, and I know that inside he is pissed off because his name looks worse on the Plus left side. Plus, they're so smaller, you can barely read them. Correct. That's the other thing I don't like. Bad for you them. and me. They, Game callers. Well, I, you don't hopefully, care. hopefully I know the guy's name when he comes up to hit, and I don't need to look <laughs> at the back of his jersey. I'm just saying. That's why AJ but, doesn't do Yankees games. Because he yeah, doesn't know the names. Yeah, gosh, I can't do a name on the. He's not they do have the number there on the front. That was, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I want to get my hands on one. Yeah, and actually see one, and then and then make it's hard. But the one thing I did see um, that I didn't like is where Miles Michael has said the pants they're not no longer customized as much, and like that was one of the cool things about being in the big. You get your pants and your shirt however you wanted. You could literally say like, add two inches on my sleeve. Yep. Taper in the stomach a little bit to make me look skinnier. Add some to the thigh, make them tighter in the calf. I mean, whatever you wanted to do, they would do. And the fact that you're hearing now, oh, well, they can't do all that. Well, that just sucks because that was one of the cool things. Along with the one-eared helmet, the single flap helmet, and customized pants. Those were two of like the first like thing where you're like, man, I'm in the big leagues. I get I can get these however I want them. It's 2024, and we're taking away custom for players. I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to I'd have to know. I mean, I'd have a hard time believing that they're taking away custom, but if Michael has said it. I mean, he's been in the league for a long time, and I, because they would always come into spring training. They'd be like, "Hey, come back to the training room. How do you like these pants? This is your pant." And they would, you know, they'd have you'd have the flap in the back of your waistband, and they would say, "Oh, you like that? You sure you don't want any less? You sure you don't want any more? We can do this. Good. Boom. That's easy." Some guys would go in. They'd be like, "I want a short pant. I want a short baggy pant." I went long, tight pants. Like, so they have like three different kinds and the equipment guys like, okay, awesome. Great. Thank you. Cause then they got to buy gray. They got to buy no pinstripe, no stripe. They got to buy white, whatever pants they, they have. So I used to always a, get baggy pants for, whatever. for when I didn't play. Cause and most of the teams I went on, we weren't allowed to wear shorts. So days like we take BP, I'd wear the shortcut pants because it was more like wearing shorts and wearing the full length ones. So, I mean, I, I guess I was one of those people. What's the industry? 14 billion, whatever it is. I feel like whatever you want, we'll give it to you. you want custom yeah. uniform? It's all good. You know what I'm saying? That's not where you 
Some people said it was costs. nice, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see the Mariners jersey that was in there. We got the one Gilbert right and Lobo. Kirby. Yeah. Was, are those real? Because if yes, I go into yeah. a team, those are real. If yeah. I go into a team store, okay, I'm I'm from Canada. I got down to Seattle. It's my first Mariners game. And I go into the store and I see that George Kirby jersey. I'm like, two hundred. We bucks leave the that? ballpark. Two hundred bucks <laughs> for that. Plus, you know what else is weird? And I don't know if it's the lighting of this picture. They don't look as white. They look like off, more offy white than they do like pure white. Like the home hmm. jerseys, other than I guess the Giants are are the ones that have still the cream, the cream colored home jerseys, right? Yeah. Really, yeah Guys, if you give me one hour and say, hey, ready? You have to just hit Orlando and copy that George Kirby jersey or make a better version and just like find a random store and have them, you know, patch some numbers on real quick. I think I can do better. You That's know bad. That's you know, really you bad. You know when we should have seen this coming or knew this was coming? Great Britain. When, when Great Britain had their jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for back. Kirby to be throwing and the R to fall off on his back. <laughs> <laughs> How I hope the K that? falls off after he strikes somebody out. That'd be great. I, I, I mean, I don't know the science behind the deals, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, I know Nike is supposed to be in charge of it. And they're trying to go more to like the lighter, but I don't know why. I guess maybe it makes it lighter if the numbers instead of being an inch or three quarters of an inch big. I don't know, but it just it just we'll get used to it, and we'll everyone will stop complaining about it within a year. Uh, fans won't. Because if, if they're bad, if they look like that, it'll change. Why? Because sales will go down. Yeah, but baseball fans need to figure it out because basketball, they're coming out with 10 different jerseys a season. So baseball fans, just pick, pick, pick your favorite jersey, buy it, and then move on. Like basketball, it's like the City Connect, the City Connect left left-handers jersey the city connect right-handers jersey like the south side of the city connect then they have like the it's unbelievable so it's going to come into baseball buy them jerseys up yeah there's only they're doing more city connects right every team i think will have them all except for the yankees will be the only team without one after this year right and the dodgers mm -hmm. are already on their second set so yep i mean they're trying in baseball the problem is Baseball is so far behind when it comes to jerseys and when it comes to certain things like that because they're, oh, we're so traditional. Yeah, but people now, that's not what they want. They want cool things. Like when you go talk to kids nowadays, yep. like look at college football. Look what NFL, especially but college football, for like their big recruiting weekends, they bust out a new helmet. <laughs> they wear the all-black jerseys. They, they they go back some throwbacks. They do stuff that's, that's completely different where – Baseball's like, well, these are our, I mean, the White Sox have had the same like road jerseys since like 1990 with the elastic on the, on oh, the right. arms. And I mean, it's the same thing, right? And the Yankees have had their, they changed their roads a little bit. They finally got rid of the elastic on the sleeves and went to more of a throwback type, but you know, people want to buy different stuff. That's why I think the city connects have been such a big hit because people want different things to buy. Yeah. The you can only Sox buy so many of the same. Sick. You can only buy so many of the same Aaron Judge jerseys. Mm -hmm. NFL, NFL, the Eagles wore four different uniforms this year. They played 17 games. Extrapolate that out to a baseball season. You want to see your team in 40, 40 of your, the games wearing a different jersey? Like 40 for this jersey, 40 for this jersey. For, like, it's coming. And I think, and I think baseball – needs to – like, they need to have a weekend. I don't know if it needs to be called Players Weekend or not, but they need to have a weekend where they have stuff. It, like you said, recruiting players into a college, recruiting fans into watching baseball. Biggest winner in this current debacle, people that sell knockoffs. So they're like, they're coming down a little bit. I'm, I'm getting close. Our knockoffs right. are the same. Yeah, jerseys. I mean, that sell jerseys. If I'm selling knockoffs Ooh. in the parking lot. I'm going. What's the difference? These are twenty. Those are two hundred. They look the same. They copied me. I'm buying a knockoff. Knockoffs I mean, are I mean, in, again, and they're I, way cheaper. Again, I want to get to a spring training camp and actually see. Yeah, we're going to. We're going to be in no, camp in a couple weeks. I want to see AJ touching a player with his jersey on. Ooh. Just material check, Penny. and then we'll grade it. Soft. I'm just, I'm just checking the cloth. 
All right, let's get to some other news, okay? Because camps are opening up left and right, pitchers and catchers, the whole deal. So let's start with Astros camp. A couple news items, and it begins with Josh Hader basically officially being announced as the ninth inning man. We do have new Astros manager Joe Espada talking about this little official declaration. So let's get to it. And Hader yesterday in my office, and uh, when both pitchers are available, Hader will pitch the ninth inning. How, how did that meeting go for? Uh... It, it went well. I, I think both guys want the best for this team. Um, I think the ultimate goal is to hold that trophy uh, at the end of the year, and both guys were were on board. Did you meet with both at the same time? Yes, I did. Yeah. From your perspective, how is Ryan dealing with it? Um, you know what? I'm not. I don't want to put words in Presley's mouth, so I'll let Presley answer that question. But um, everything I got from him was uh, he's on board and he's he just wants to help our team win. What were the factors? I mean, nothing surprising. Hater basically told us that a week and a half ago. Nothing surprising from the players' side either. You know, where they're both they both want to win. They're both on contracts. They've both made their money. Now it's about winning, and that's. That's huge. And yes, Hader will get an out in the eighth if needed. But with this bullpen, man, if they can get if they can get Montero back on track, geez, they are a deep, deep, deep at the at the back end. They're they're back three innings, back four innings. I mean, if they can get Montero back on track. And they think they can. And if they do, that is see why not. going to be wild. So no surprise here. I mean, no. Hater seems like he really wants it, though. Like that was Hater needed part the of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we. I remember I asked him. I said, "Who's going to pitch the ninth? You or Presley?" And he, he, without saying it, he's like, "I'm pitching the ninth. Mm -hmm. The ninth is mine." And I mean, listen, he's earned the reputation. Well, let's not forget, Brian Presley's been pretty damn good. Hell yeah, sure, especially in the postseason. Dude, in the postseason, he's a legend. I, I know. So I mean, I, I, that's I, where I get manager it. makes his money. Re you know, evaluate it. Evaluate it in the situation. Maybe haters not having it for two games. You still have Alex Presley to be able to come in and get this guy. You just spin it to your guys. Hey, you know what? We really want you to face seven, eight, nine today because that's a better matchup. Yeah, guys' feelings could be hurt, but you're trying to win a World Series. From, from 2021 to 2023, Ryan Presley's made 24 play, playoff he appearances. Doesn't give up a run. One, one earned run. He hasn't blown a save. I know that. One earned run in 24 appearances in the postseason. And he hasn't blown a save. That's incredible. It so, doesn't even feel hard. When he's in the game, it doesn't even feel like it's that difficult for him. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'll just keep throwing this slider up here, and you guys will swing, and then we'll ha high-five afterwards. <laughs> no, he's he's been a legend for the Astros. Seriously. he's He's been as automatic as they've ever been in the postseason the last three years. It, 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 the problem the Astros had last year is they couldn't get him the ball. Right. They, didn't have the lead. Yep. They, they couldn't get him the ball with the lead. So it was, but he's been, man, listen, Hater's good too. <laughs> I mean, like Hater's some <laughs> slouch. They picked up off the scrap heap. I mean, he's pretty damn good. So it's nice. If you're Joe Espada, you're looking down there going, well, I got the seventh, eighth, and ninth locked up. He was, how do we get there? How do we get there in the news today? I don't know if we're going to go there yeah, next. Let's but do it. The news about Verlander being behind schedule is a little concerning if you're Joe Espada and the Astros. Well, especially because you're missing some other guys who will be back eventually. They have a little bit of the Rangers game plan going on. I mean, it's been a minute, but hopefully Lance McCullers comes back in the second half of the season. And same with I feel Luis like McCullers Garcia. hasn't pitched in forever. It's been a really long time. He's had a really, really tough go. So here's Verlander. He said he's a couple weeks behind. Timetable to be announced. Quote, when I first started playing catch, I usually shut it down for a while. This time when I shut it down and picked the ball back up, my shoulder didn't feel so great, so I kind of had to take a step back. Isn't that what he got on? Isn't that what he landed on the IL last year? And when I when I heard he was kind of behind, I just looked at it was a random like side by side of his pitching mechanics from twenty two to twenty three once he came back, and there was a significant difference. I can't. I'm not good at mechanic stuff, but there was a significant difference, and I wonder if he was just able to mask it, Ma mask it, and have a three-two-two last year. And if it, you know, did it linger, and then all of a sudden when he shut it down, something tightened up. Something like, you know, it's going to take him longer to get going. Who knows? That would be that. That would be a question to ask of him. Yeah, remember last year, 
He didn't start the season on time. It was a low grade Terry's major strain. I remember mm. the concern meter started to go off for me then because no Edwin Diaz for the entire season for the Mets. And then you're missing Verlander to start the year. Scherzer gets off to a slow start. The offense just looked mid and you're like, uh-oh, is this team mm. even going to make the playoffs? So very different s- scenario here. Astros pitching is much more talented, much deeper than Verlander's team at the beginning of last season. So your concern level's high. I mean, for me, I guess you could have a little bit of concern about Verlander giving them a full healthy season as he's getting up there in age. But you just want this team to get in the playoffs. Like I know, you know, you want them to win the division, but if they don't, don't you still feel good about the Astros? Like if the Mariners or the Rangers take the division and they don't because they've got some pitching depth issues in the beginning of the year, don't you still feel okay? This is the spot. This is the spot that you would feel kind of, I don't know about, is their starting rotation. Are they, you know, are they looking to get 22 starts at them, Kershaw style from now on? Look, if you put up a sub 3-3 ERA, you'll take 22 starts. I get it. It's going to cost you $43 million, but you'll take 22 starts. Plus, I don't think he'll – I had to look at his vesting option, but I don't think he'd hit his vesting option, so that's good for the – that's good for the Astros. Yeah, he has some – he has an inning. Him and Scherzer, I thought, had some inning incentive. Yeah, he needs to hit 140. 140. Oh, he can miss time and still get to 140. That's, you know. Yeah, he needs 140 for to, the third year vesting third option year for 25 in. at 35 million. Okay. I mean, he can he, listen, he can miss some time and get that. Yeah. He hit, he hit 168 last year. And he missed what? 6 weeks? Yeah. Uh no. No, cuz he had he had 27 starts, so that would be A month? 3 weeks. 3 weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, but this is February 14th. So, let's see. I mean, this is we don't even know if he's going to but we don't even know if this he's going to miss that much time. Know, yeah, but, but I mean, if, even if he misses starts, Fromber struggled last year big time, and they lost his security blanket, Maldonado, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian Javier was not the same Christian Javier last mm-hmm. year. They got Verlander to kind of right the ship, and he did a good job when he got back to Houston, right? But after that, Hunter Brown maybe, I mean, J.P. France, you're looking at like, okay, who's going to be after that? Urquidy. Urquidy, who's been injury prone to say the least, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he missed a whole significant – Garcia's out, right, for the year, I think? No, Garcia – and no. McCullers, I think, if I yeah. right now they're, think, they're, they're, they're oh, thinking. Well, I, know Gar- I thought Garcia had shoulder. No, TJ. Yeah, TJ. Oh, he he's supposed to come back. I believe it's August. I mean, this okay. is when everyone's coming back, and you're starting to get the, you're the hopeful, timetable. Well, you're updates. hopeful they come back because it, let's it not forget, TJ. like Walker Bueller was supposed to come back last year, he didn't come back. True. Right. I mean, there's guys that take longer than others. It's not like everyone right at a year comes back. No, actually, when I talk about players that are coming back, is pitchers. July, August, etc. I would say at least half of them end up having another problem, and you don't see them. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, the yeah. Dodgers stash guys, and one or two end up popping up. Right, they'll sign those guys either for those two-year deals or even just a one-year deal, and he's going to come back late. And a lot of them don't even ever appear again. You know, so yeah, if only there was a left-handed moment. pitcher on the market that strikes a lot of guys out and really doesn't go that deep into games because you have a deep three to four dudes in the pen that can also strike dudes out. That. Hopefully they can find that somebody in the That heat. guy's not going to Houston. Mm-mm. I'm just saying he's there. They don't have any money. They don't have any money. <laughs> they spent it on Hater. They spent it on Hater. An Altuve extension. Mm-hmm. Pregnant they want to save it for extensions. one of those And keeping guys. the lights on for the last seven Octobers in a row. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think Jim can... Crane owns some place called the Floridian down here that is just awful. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's awful. Awful goal. Awful goal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what the win. profits are. Yeah, Jim he does. Crane he does. He, and he's a win. winning owner. And yes, when he tries. When you want to win, the other thing he he wants too is he wants good people. He he makes it a priority for the guys that he signs to be dudes that will step up and sign autographs. Be be accessible in the media. When I was there for the six weeks I was there, he made that very abundantly clear. Like he would come in after Altuve was signing down the line and he would okay. come in and he'd be like, Hey, great job, Hosey. I saw you. I saw you out there signing. He pays attention to that kind of stuff. So he wants to win. He wants to make a culture. Blake Snell could be the guy. 
Yeah, he missed a couple times. Ozuna, remember he went and traded for Ozuna that time? Mm-hmm. Roberto yeah. Ozuna. That yeah. was a big miss, remember? Oh, I forgot about that. <clears throat> so maybe, I mean, he might that might have changed, but he back he was I mean, let, let's be let's not forget. He also let the the garbage can thing yeah. happen. I mean, you can say he wants good people, but he also let the garbage can thing happen. And don't give me the bullshit he didn't know either cuz they they knew. I'll say this cuz we're about to go to a very different case here in a moment. Most fans are okay with what they've gotten in Houston the past ten years, and they're pretty they're they're model fortunate. Right? And even Winning after getting wise. through all of that, yes, they became the villains. Mm-hmm. They've still been super successful. Now to the worst owner in sports, and an announcement that we would like to make. He's gonna I be am wearing. <laughs> yes, joining us next is the <laughs> owner of the. No, I am wearing the cell shirt, which I've worn multiple times, including in other countries, because this show supports the city of Oakland and how much of a freaking garbage, garbage mess this Oakland A's situation has been with Vegas. And we still don't have a lot of plans unveiled for Vegas. So of course the A's barely touch their social. They do everything wrong. They don't take care of their fans. They quiet quit on their fans for years, but that doesn't stop fans from having their own fans fest fans fest plural is happening on February 24th, Saturday. And it is hosted by the Oakland 68s and our friends at Last Dive Bar and Foul Territory will be there on Saturday, February 24th with a live show. Tons of guests joining us, including Trevor May, Coco Crisp. I think the mayor's going to hop on. It's going to be fucking awesome. Chris Davis, Graham Balfour. With a K. With a K. It's a hard hard Chris Chris. Davis. There are VIP guests in attendance there. How do you supposed to be there? I'm not sure. I don't know the whole list. Follow the socials. We just put them up there. At Oakland 68s, at Last Dive Bar. They cover not only Fans Fest, but the situation in Oakland better than anyone. But FT Live will be there on Saturday, February 24th in Oakland. I will be there, and I will host the show with fellow former Oakland players. So it is February 24th. We will pop on and give you more details in terms of when we will be doing the show live. But we will be there with the fans that deserve attention every single day on this topic. And there's news basically every single day on this topic, including yesterday. So to celebrate our announcement, we are bringing on one of the best, most impactful voices on this matter in the game. And that is Casey Pratt, who works for ABC7 and is out there in Oakland seeing what's going on on a daily basis. And I love the shirt. Casey, great to have you on. And first off, dude, I'm excited to meet you in person. What can you tell us about Fans Fest and your involvement coming up? And can you just explain it even better than I just did? Yeah, you did a great job, actually. But what it is, is this happened in the past as well, where the A's just flat out neglected to throw their own Fan Fest. So the Oakland 68's last dive bar stepped up and threw their own. They did this a couple of years ago at Brooklyn Basin on the waterfront. It was spectacular. This is way, way bigger. It's Jack London Square. Like you said, lots of former A's in attendance too. And look, this isn't like a let's all get together and hate the A's fest. It's an Oakland fans fest. It's about Oakland fans. Former A's like Coco Chris, Grant Balfour, Trevor May, who recently retired, will be there. Uh, JT Snow, uh, one of AJ Pruszynski's former teammates, I believe, will be there with the Oakland Ballers, the Oakland Roots. I mean, this is all about the fans. It's free. It's for the people. And of course, you guys will be there too. Yeah, Wait, JT Snow, he was a giant. How was he invited to the? <laughs> Fan. That doesn't JT make any Snow sense. Snow is bench coach of the Ballers now, man. He's going to be there too. Oh, okay. Can you tell us a bit about the Ballers too? As there's been a lot of news surrounding them, and um, it's Don Wakamatsu as the manager, right? He's actually he's actually tippy top. He's he's above GM. He's he's like oh. helping advise the whole thing. So Don Wakamatsu wow. is one of the leading voices on this. But the Ballers are basically a startup baseball team. They saw what was happening in Oakland and just could not stand it. So. They created their own Pioneer League franchise to come and at least give baseball back to Oakland. I know people say Pioneer League, oh, big deal. We're losing Major League Baseball. That's terrible. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is the void the A's have already left in the community, you know, Little League, Youth Baseball, all these things, the ballers are stepping up and filling that void. So it's really like a community-driven team. Obviously, it's a, you know, independent Pioneer League baseball team that will play games and get everybody together. But I think at the grassroots level, it's such a cool thing that they're doing. So lots of good stuff going on there. Like I said, JT Snow is bench coach of that team. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around the ballers right now here. 
What what is the what is the schedule of events for this? I was invited, unfortunately, sadly, I can't make it. But what what is the schedule of events? I mean, what we're, they're having this in downtown Oakland, if I'm not mistaken, right? And what yeah, are they going to have the people? They're speaking, sign signing autographs. What's the what's the give me give me the rundown here? Yeah, all of that. Okay, so there's a nightclub right on the waterfront. That's where the main stage is going to be. Outside, there's going to be another big stage. I'll be MC, so I'll be talking to the people like Coco and Trevor May and Grant Balfour and you know, even the Oakland mayor, like you said. Um, so there will be an indoor and outdoor stage, live music, tons of booths where fans can meet, get autographs, get introduced to these new teams like the Ballers. Uh, the Oakland Roots are going to drop their new kit at Fans Fest. So there's a ton of stuff going on, and it's free to attend. So you know, in the past, the A's have actually done their own fan fest at Jack London Square. It's this big outdoor area right on the water. It's beautiful. So it's going to be a great area for everyone to walk around. And also, hilariously, it's where the A's team offices are located. So they'll probably be looking out the window <laughs> wistfully uh, looking at the event because I know none of the A's employees or front office are uh, allowed by the A's to attend. I've told them they should show up, though, but I don't think they're allowed to. <laughs> Love that. Okay. Um, let's get to some news too. Yeah. I would be surprised um, if someone showed up from the A's. And we'd see what happens. Cool invited, like the front office showed invited, up. Guys. They, Billy they Bean shows up. They they only have, might be popular there. B Billy Bean has made tons of money. He's a nice He's guy. But, but, but my thing is, like, if he shows up, what are you going to do? You're going to fire him? Exactly. That's my point. Like, come on. That's my point. They made, a, they made a crappy movie about him. If you think about it too, I mean, his livelihood, right? has been supported by the people that are all going to be here. So, you know, if, if I was him, I would go. It's not like he's fresh into the game and, ooh, I don't want to piss anyone off. Like, yeah. he should go. You're right. He I'll is, try and though, get word a special in. advisor to John Fisher, so I don't know how that would Yeah, I don't think he's going to No, go. I know. He I'm, likes I'm his saying, <laughs> yeah, politically, he likes he's his, not going to go. He, he likes gets his a pass a lot spot. on this, you guys. Yeah. He gets a pass a lot on this, but he's, he's in there. But, but his boss sucks. So, Casey, let's go over that because news just came out in the past 24 hours that the A's are going to chat with city officials about maybe hanging out for a few extra years before they do their ditch over to Vegas in 2028. So what do you know about this story? And I think what I'm sensing is from the A's community that I interact with, they feel like they might get aggressive the a's with the city and they're worried that the city is going to give in to allow them to play there and they shouldn't what do you think yeah there's a lot more going on on this than people realize i tweeted that yesterday and everybody freaked out my phone blew up look the a's are gone after 2024 their lease expires the city has no reason to grant them amnesty and save them they're at this point now where they're a nomadic team from 25, 26, 27 until maybe they have a ballpark in 28. They've been looking at Sacramento. They've been looking at Salt Lake City. They have nowhere to play baseball. And if they leave Oakland, I know a lot of people probably don't follow this very closely, the, the watch, but if they leave Oakland, they lose $70 million a year if they leave the Bay Area. So they have every incentive to stay. Even Sacramento would void that deal. So they have to stay here or they lose $70 million a year. That's the backdrop in which they're going to walk to the table with the city of Oakland, a table that they unceremoniously flipped over when they decided to, to leave negotiations upright and go to Las Vegas. The city already has a tenant ready to play sports in the Coliseum in 2025. I'm going to break that thing a little bit later in the week, but they already have that. So this is where it gets crazy, you guys. And tell me if I'm throwing too many you know coals into the fire here, but the A's deal with the Coliseum is actually not very good for the city of Oakland. They're paying like $1.25 million up to $1.5 million a year in rent. If anybody else does a special event or plays at the Coliseum, the city gets all the parking, concessions, and a share of the tickets. For the A's, they just get that flat fee. And so it's actually far more lucrative for them to have special events, other teams, anybody else come in there and play than the A's. So the A's now have to walk in and ask for the city's forgiveness on Thursday, and that's going to be an interesting meeting. I, I hate it that you said you're going to drop it later because I want to know who's actually playing there because <laughs> this is – because then it also tells me, like, how how much would they be willing to let the A's have it for? If, if they're paying $1.2 to $1.5 you could essentially say 
well, you can rent it for the year for $10 million because they know what kind of revenue they're going to bring in if it's not the A's. And it's clearly not just some, you know, it's not a beer league softball team that's coming into play there. Yeah. So the city can say, here's what we want, right? We want a crap ton of money. Like you're going to have to pay us a fortune if you want to play here and keep that $70 million a year. Or they can say, we want to keep the name and colors of the A's in Oakland. You go to Vegas, whatever, but we're keeping the A's here. Or they could say, we want an expansion team or some promises of an expansion team. Or they could say, John Fisher, you own the half of the Coliseum site that the county sold you. We want you to give that up at fair market value and get off our land so we can at least develop this 100 plus acres. So they have a lot to ask for on the city side. We'll see how much the A's are willing to give up. You you kind of brought up a bunch of different stuff. Is there a chance... MLB steps in with this because as of last week, Rob Manfred kind of sounded annoyed by what was going on with the whole, hey, we don't have a place to play, but Nito, it's going to be awesome in Vegas. Like, is there a chance MLB steps in? Yeah, I think MLB has already stepped in and you saw the unanimous vote. I think the silence from the A side tells you a lot. I think Major League Baseball is doing everything they can to push this along. I think the power players in Vegas, some of them at least, are doing everything they can to push this along. The A's are really, at this point, succeeding in spite of themselves. Because if you saw what they did in Oakland, I mean, they tried Fremont, they tried San Jose, they failed at multiple sites in Oakland. They've yet to get a deal done anywhere. And so I think all these different groups are now stepping in trying to save this deal where it would be so much easier just to say, sell the team, just sell the team, get somebody in here that actually wants to stay. And then maybe in 2028, if you get Vegas figured out, go ahead and make that the first expansion team. And Casey, in my mind, the city should just start with, we get A's and we get an expansion team or you don't get this period. That's how it should start because I mean, Joe Lacob's a good example, right? I mean, you can talk more about him, the Warriors owner and how he's made multiple public comments that, he would buy the team for a fair market price and actually do what should be done with the new site and building around it. And he even said, of course, hey, we're billionaires. We can afford this ourselves. I'll just fund the thing. Yeah, well, Lakeup has made it public. He wants the team. He can't say too much, though, because if you piss off baseball, you're never going to get a franchise. You remember, he thought he was going to get the A's already when he was passed over for Lou Wolf, the frat buddy of Bud Selig. So, I mean, this whole thing has been kind of ripe with disaster from the jump. Uh, I think a lot of the reason that we're in the situation we're in out here is because of what Bug Selig did, forcing the team to his frat buddy instead of Reggie Jackson's group or a Joe Lacob group, uh, which probably would have been a heck of a lot better. Um, You know, Reggie himself said he had an offer where it was basically like, take any offer and I will put it higher than that offer. And he still didn't get the team because obviously he gave it to Lou Wolf. I mean, I want to hear from someone that's out there on the ground. What are the chances the A's actually end up in Vegas? Because we keep having guests on there like, there are still a lot of obstacles. There are still a lot of roadblocks. There's no stadium renderings. I mean, Fisher hasn't put out anything. I mean, heck, the Royals have put out renderings. The White Sox, (laughs) who don't even have anywhere really to go, they've already put out renderings from a new stadium they want. (laughs) And yet the the, the A's have done nothing. So what are the chances that this doesn't happen and the the A's are like, I mean, I would love to see it because it would make me laugh so hard. Like Kratz said, they basically crawl back to Oakland and beg them to keep them. And Oakland's like, yeah, sorry, go kick rocks. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I'm on the ground here in Oakland, but I also spent the entire last week in Las Vegas covering the 49ers for the Super Bowl. So I spent a lot of time walking around the Tropicana, talking to all the big journalists out there in Vegas. And it's funny because I would really put it at like a 75% chance they end up in Vegas. The people that are most dialed in in the Vegas scene all told me 50-50. That was the number they gave me. They don't believe the hype in the A's out there. I think the only thing that really got me is like when you walk around Las Vegas and look at the Tropicana site, first of all, it's tiny. Second of all, they said they're going to have a retractable roof. Now it looks pretty certain they will not. Uh, And then they're going to have a bunch of developments around the ballpark that Bally's is building. What I noticed about the site is it's very congested. The cabbies, everyone you ask out there said it's a terrible place for a ballpark. It's going to be impossible to get to. The local residents don't want it on the strip, and that's exactly where it is. So there's a lot of boxes it doesn't check. And all we have seen are fake drawings, drawings the team themselves said wad up and throw away. We've never even seen the real ones. But the thing that struck me the most is if you stand on the site and you just look around, every property around that site is owned by MGM. 
So you better believe MGM wants that stadium there because they don't have to do anything and then they get to benefit from it being there. And MGM's a big time power player in Vegas. So I give them some credit for that. But yeah, uh, there is basically zero answers out there. They don't have financing. Uh, they don't have renderings. It's kind of a mess. Even when we were there for Super Bowl week, the Las Vegas mayor stepped up and said they should stay in Oakland and build on the waterfront, which made massive headlines. Like, the Super Bowl is in Vegas. The eyes of the entire world are upon Vegas. Where were the A's? They weren't there at all. They didn't even make a post on social media about Vegas and the world stage being there. So it, it really seems like silence is deafening at this point for them out there. Scott's shirt says sell. You mentioned sell like three or four times already. What are the chances that John Fisher actually sells? And what does that look like? What what does the A's name, at what kind of value does the A's actually have if it were to be sold? Yeah, I mean, he stands to make well over a billion dollars if this team sold, you guys. He, he bought it for like $180 million. He didn't buy it for a lot. It's going to be over a billion dollars in a sale at least. So he can say to everybody around, look, I inherited billions of dollars. I'm a billionaire because I was born wealthy. But look, I made this billion dollars myself. He can do that if he sells the A's. And he could still probably expand to Vegas using that money. And you could have a guy like Joe Lacob, who just tried to acquire LeBron James at the trade deadline. This dude is out to win. I cannot understand why Major League Baseball wouldn't want that above everything else. You could win in Vegas and Oakland. If you just do this right, but I'm not sure that Rob Manfred has the creativity to get that done. I agree with 99% of what you said. The only What's thing the I'll disagree with, there's there's <laughs> one one thing in the entire 15 minutes we've had, Casey. If John Fisher gets rich off selling the A's, which he would, or richer on his own ish, obviously. He, you know, was born on third base and can't get home. Born on third base, hit a triple, can't get home. Anyway, um, MLB would not let him back in. So if he wanted to be part of a new expansion situation, True. this dude is a disaster. It is embarrassing. But he's done a lot of work. Like he's gotten it this far, right? And they haven't kicked him out yet. If they hated him that much, you can't kick him out. The That's out? the whole thing. We talk to owner. I mean, we talk to fans all the time. Almost every time we bring up the A's, fans go, "Well, why don't they just kick him out?" You can't do that. It is there. There is no precedent for that. You can't no. just kick a guy out. No. Yeah, there's you got to be zero precedent for that. It is his business. He hasn't done anything, quote, illegal, although he's kind of paying off politicians, but that's a whole other story. Um, but <laughs> you can't kick him out. But what you can do is prevent him from ever coming back. MLB just dealt with a somewhat similar situation, not as dire, but John Angelos, son of a billionaire, is not qualified to run a baseball team, needs to just take his money and run. He just did that. There is no chance MLB would ever let him touch the league again. These are poisonous people to the sport. They're not stupid. You know, we're, we can be critical as much as we want, but the league still wants baseball to be successful in terms of a profitable, well-liked business. These guys are so, so bad for the game. There's no way they would ever let him back. So take your billions, go into waste management. It's a much easier way to make tons of money and act like the trash can that you are, John. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I, now that you're done, thank you for your soapbox. I love it. My, my only question is, you you said something and it just, it, it still makes me go, man, well, that's weird. You said it was, because at one time they were talking about a retractable roof. Now, I know Vegas gets really hot in the summer, but it's also really nice at certain times of year. So are they going no roof, which can't happen, mm -mm. or they're going to go full dome? So I, I'm assuming it, the retractable roof wouldn't happen because it would cost $100 million more dollars that they don't have that Fisher doesn't have. Yeah, so the retractable roof would probably be at least $150 million more. Obviously, money financing is already an issue. Furthermore, it's nine acres. It would be one of the tiniest ballparks in all of baseball. You need room for the retractable roof to open and close, which is why I don't think we're ever going to see a retractable roof on that site. Like I said, I walked around that site. It is very, very small. When I walk around Howard Terminal in Oakland, you guys, it's 55 acres, and that feels tiny. Nine acres is miniature. So I think this is going to be a fixed roof stadium. Then it calls into question, what does that mean for the turf, the grass? How are they going to do that? Like at Allegiant Stadium, there's a whole field tray that slides in and out of the stadium so they can grow the grass outside. I don't know if you can do that on nine acres. I, I don't see how in the world you'd have room for that. So at the best possible scenario, they'd probably have a window that shows the strip. And I don't think that really does a whole lot, which is probably why you're not seeing any renderings, because they have not put out any real ones.
It's going to be a 5,000 seat stadium. Dude, this is like, this is, <laughs> the more, the more we talk about this, honestly, the more we talk about this, the bigger joke it becomes. I, like if you're going to do this, right. If you're going to move a team, most of the time, like whenever I don't, this, this hasn't really happened in forever. Right. Teams, nationals. Nationals. Right. But they, they, but they had a plan in place where yes. they're like, we're going to have to go to RFK for a couple of years. And then we're going to build this awesome new ballpark. This seems like it's just like they're literally just like throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks. Like, oh, let's try this. Oh, this Tropicana nine acre. We can make it fit on nine acres. What? Dude, this is like when I bring my suck. my carry on on a flight and it doesn't fit and you're just smashing it yeah. in and you're like, come on, I know a ballpark can fit <laughs> in here. Come on. Like Ben Stiller and uh, Meet the Parents. <laughs> Sir, that's not going to fit. You need to check. I'm throwing the check into the bags. That's yeah, I mean, it's a lot like that. The issue is. If that's the case, I've offered the A's so many times. I've offered them so many opportunities to explain this all to me. Let's just sit down. Just tell me your plan. If the wrong information is out there, give me the right information. I've told them over and over again. I don't care if people get mad at me. If the truth is the truth, let's put the truth out there. And they never do. What does that tell you? No, it, it's it's just so shady. It's so mm. scummy the way this is handled and the way this is talked about publicly because it barely ever is besides that. But again, Awful if you're going to do it, do it right. Like, I'm fine. That's if, what I'm it, saying. If yes. they wanted to do it right They're and they not. wanted, they, and they were like, okay, we're going to do It's kind of like when the A's, when Al Davis came back to the Raiders and he put that horrific thing in Mount Davis in center field, right? Like, it ruined that whole ballpark. So, if, yeah. again, it wasn't done right. It was just right. Let's just hurry up and do this because we need it, right? Well, if you're going to take a team and move them somewhere, at least th- there should have been so much of more of a plan. Like, we're going to do this and we're going to move here. We're going to. You know, do whatever it takes. And then we're going to build this awesome new stadium where people are like, holy shit. Because, like, when you go to these new stadiums now, you look around, you're like, holy shit, this is, these are really amazing. You see the renderings of the Royals. You're like, damn, that's cool. Like, it looks out over the downtown skyline. You're like, oh, and Chicago's new one. You're like, damn, that's amazing. And they, he said they're going to have a window where you might be able to stay. Come on. Like, that's why you need. You, they're building a prison. No, John just, Fisher couldn't open a lemonade stand, dude. This is just not the kind of person that can get something like this done. You have to be a pioneer when you're expanding a, a, into a new city like this. This is the worst person you could pick on the planet to be able to set up something like this. He, just, he can't get a deal done. So anyway, we're going to talk about this, but we're also going to have some fun out there. Casey, I'm excited to meet in person. And like you mentioned, also just celebrate the history of the A's, the impact that this team makes in the community. I'll talk more about this when I'm out there, but when we had Dave Stewart on one of our shows, he mentioned how you know, Reggie Jackson was was getting him into the ballpark and ended up being a mentor for him. And I mean, there are so many cool stories about how the A's have impacted the lives of people that are involved in baseball. But I mean, Dave stands out for me because then he's become an executive, all that, right? Like if the A's don't exist, we don't have a Dave Stewart in our game. That's just one of a yeah. billion examples we'll go over. So I'm excited to talk about some of that as well. And that also plays to why baseball belongs in that community. Yeah, Ricky Henderson's another great example. I mean, Kurt Flood, there's so many. I mean, the history of baseball in Oakland is rich even before the A's. So I think there's a lot of great stories to tell. And that's kind of what Fans Fest shout out is to celebrate. It's to celebrate the Oakland fans, the Oakland community. It's not just the A's. I mean, there's so much more to it. And I think that... You'll find that out a lot more when you're out there. I can't wait to see you guys out there. I'm excited that you're coming out. And I'll be MC on stage doing a bunch of things, but I, I will also hop on the show with you guys. And, you know, this is kind of funny. I have a really nice home studio setup. It was just not working for your show, so check this out. I actually had to take a baseball and wedge it in my laptop to get my mobile phone kit set up here just for you guys. So I've been holding this baseball <laughs> for like 15 minutes just for you. Well, dude, you crushed it. We <laughs> didn't notice so it. I'm so tired now. So tired. <laughs> I, know, I feel like I'm pitching nine innings at this point. <laughs> dude, you crushed it. Because if we tried to get John Fisher on, we would just have a blank screen and no audio. So dude can't probably I'm trying can't to get him do a on Zoom too. call. I've been talking to him. I'm trying to sit down with the man. Let's get this going. Come on. For people that haven't seen, watch the YouTube clip of him speaking in Vegas. That's the whole clip where then they ask for people to cheer and no one does but the actual speaking from him is is like mind blown on how bad it is so anyway plus he mentions how he's a giants fan uh sneaks think that about in there kevin as well. from the office i think that's kind of the cadence we have going on hey we had him on yesterday don't make fun of kevin malone we literally <laughs> had him on yesterday Wait, had casey, him on last yesterday. thing yeah. casey he actually shouted you out 
I swear no to way. God. I got to yes. go back so, and listen. I actually, I love the show, you guys, but I actually slept almost all day yesterday because I was in Vegas for an entire week covering the Super Bowl. So I got he home said and your I name. slept like all day. <laughs> Dude, well, you missed Brian Baumgartner, who is Kevin in the office. Um, we showed the meme of the chili being spilled and talking about <laughs> the off season in the Bay Area. And he said, oh, tell Casey Pratt that was good. Dope, dude. I love that. And and I think that he needs to do a cameo or at least a voice impersonation of John Fisher for Fans Fest. That would be the coolest thing ever. He's got a cameo. He's got a cameo. I mean, Go ch- check it out. What is it? Check it bucks? out. It's like 50 bucks. 50 it's bucks. Cheap, Let's do oh, it. That's money Let's well spent, it. boys. Yes. Yeah. Well, Casey, great to talk to you here. We'll see you out in Oakland, all right? All right. I'll bring this baseball. I'll autograph it for you. Thank you. Please. Thanks. I'll bring it back to AJ. Appreciate you, man. And uh, <laughs> Have one a more good one, look. Guys. You too. One more look at what we're doing there and a shout out in the super chat from Last Dive Bar, who's been, you know, the, that group has been incredibly accommodating with everything getting set up for us, obviously, to do a show out there. And the Oakland 68s will be out on Saturday, February 24th. Wanted to really give this a lot of love and attention, which we've been doing. All right. We're going I'm to. Sad. I'm actually sad I can't make it. Do you feel a little FOMO now? I do. Because, yeah. I mean, I just can't. And it just, it just wouldn't work with the timing, but I feel. It's going to be fun. I know. I just, you know, Oakland fans and I don't have the best relationship over the years. So no better way to make. Friends. I know, but we've done nothing. I, I, I mean, we've done nothing but support the fans of yes. on, on the show and bring to light all the shit that's going down out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to see some of those people that used to boo the shit out of me would be kind of fun. And, uh, you know, I want to meet the marching band they had out there in the outfield and all the people with the flags. And uh, they were always awesome. You'd be drunk out there because everyone would buy you a beer. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. They'd be like, thanks for coming. Thanks for supporting us. We deserve to have a team. It's a big, passionate fan base. Nobody is going to buy season tickets when it's a 105-loss team every year. They can't even keep the ballpark like suitable for you know infestation. Um, and then they double your ticket prices. They are trying to keep people out. They're doing everything besides putting up walls and saying, you cannot enter this ballpark. You know, to be able to say, oh, look, our attendance is down. They've been doing that for years. He's been quiet. Real life, real life Major League. Yeah. It real is. Life, it's Major real life Major League. League. Mm-hmm. Don't you movie. want to move to Palm Beach? Didn't you want to move to Palm Beach in that movie? Yeah. Is that you what it was? To move the yeah. team to Palm Beach. Real there quick, before we get to Tyler, the thing he said was mind-blowing to me. The A's were not in Vegas. You're moving your team to a city, and you have the – greatest number of people possible coming to that city for the biggest spectacle in America, the Super Bowl. And you were not there being like, hey, I know you came in for this. Come in in three years. We're going to be here. Like that. That's like a – they put the ball on the tee and John Fisher was just sitting there swinging and missing and swinging and missing, not being at the Super Bowl as a representative for the A's. Anything that you would expect them to do right, they're going to do the opposite. Yeah, they're not doing anything. I would have been shocked if they were there and actually doing something correctly. Shocked. I mean, listen, Allegiant Stadium where the Super Bowl was is like Mandalay Bay. It's like Allegiant Stadium, yeah. Mandalay Bay, where the new stadium is going to be. And the strip yeah. is in between. Mm-hmm. Like They could have had like something, oh, been some awesome. sort of something. Because there is that empty parking lot that's there next to Tropicana. They could have had something like. Super cool. I don't know. Came up with some marketing people are way smarter than me and you, but like, hey guys, come check out our where our new ballpark's gonna be. This is what it's gonna look like. Maybe have like a a, a screen, like this is what it's gonna look like from home plate. And this is what you'll look like. I don't know, but have somebody hitting BP in the parking lot. Like, this is cool. First BP at the new site. Anyway. Yeah, a million things. But that's the thing. I actually, you know, we've all said, I want baseball in Vegas eventually. This is the wrong group to represent our sport it sucks all right let's get to our next guest on ft first time on this show surprisingly i was like damn we haven't had tyler kepner on longtime friend of mine uh, one of the best baseball writers in the biz uh long time at the new york times now with the athletic tyler kepner joining us and you can follow him at tyler kepner on twitter tyler great to see you and what's your spring training plans like uh hey guys yeah good to be here um I've worked with you before, Scott, on the radio side and the TV, and AJ and, and Eric. I've interviewed Eric. I grew up right near you, and uh, Lan- you're in from Lansdale, right? Yep, yep. You yeah. went to GA, didn't you? Yes, yes, sir. Yep. I uh, 
Yeah, I was in Gwinnett Valley and, uh, well, Flower Town for a while in Gwinnett Valley. So, uh, yeah, it's all that same kind of Monco region. I, I worked down in Flower Town during high school. We used to really? Have a, Whereabouts? The, far, the farmer's market. Okay. Oh, nice. Right. Over by the old CVS. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, wait, yeah, are no, you I'm Amish, just, wait, are you Amish, Amish too? No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, I, uh, I'll be going down in, in a week or so. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, a week or so. Going to Arizona first for a while, then uh, then Florida. So it's the first time for me with the athletics. So that'll be cool. Kind of working with uh, that whole team of guys over there and guys and girls. It's uh, it's exciting. Just got fun with Jason Stark. You know, to be teammates with him and Kenny Rosenthal. It's uh, it's 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 really cool. So yeah, it's, cool it's awesome, dude. Con- congratulations on the move out there. Um, well, just to spill our last combo into this one, what have been your thoughts on what's going on with John Fisher? I mentioned him specifically because obviously. You know, there's problems with Oakland, and and we mentioned how we want a team in Vegas at some point. But this is the wrong person to be kind of one of the faces of the sport lately for trying to expand the game into a new market. Yeah, it's it's really – it's been such a tedious uh, ordeal out there in Oakland, right? Like, you know, all these – stadium plans and sites that they build up and they promote and they hype and nothing ever happens. Um, and I, I just won't believe anything about the A's until there's actually shovels in the ground and money committed and all that stuff, um, you know, sealed up because it just never seems to happen. Um, and that speaks to the leadership that, that, that cannot get it done. Um, they couldn't get it done in Oakland, couldn't get it done in all the surrounding areas in Northern California now they can't seem to get it done in uh, in Vegas. And you guys were right. I mean, we just had the entire entertainment world in Vegas. Um, and it would have been a great opportunity for the A's to kind of, you know, start making some inroads there and, 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 and all that stuff. Uh, and you didn't hear anything about them. And you can't you can't do this wrong. you got to get it right. And I just don't have much confidence that they're going to get it right. How much does this hurt baseball? Obviously, this hurts Oakland fans, but how much does it hurt baseball? I think it does hurt baseball to have one franchise that's just out there um, that is so mismanaged and so kind of, um, you know, such a not up to standard, right? I mean, like you look at you go to places, you know, around the game and then you go to Oakland. Um, you look at the way teams are run around the game and then you look at the way things are in Oakland and it's just not right. It's not big league. You know, it's, there's a standard for the big leagues and, uh, and this is not it. And it is at 29 other teams, even Tampa Bay, you know, with, with how well they do and how smartly they're run. Um, 29 other teams are, are big league. And then you got, you got Oakland. It's, it's, it is sad. So Tyler, let's get to some other teams in the sport. Um, and it's also, and one other thing, it's also for the game, Eric. It's it's keeping baseball from growing in the sense that it's that you can't. They've said all along you can't expand until you figure out Tampa and Oakland. And now it seems like Tampa's going down the, the path, and Oakland's still still uh, spinning their wheels. Well, so I'll double down for a sec because yeah. you know what's funny to me, Tyler, is when we when it said we can't expand unless this gets figured out. I mean, you can. There's no rules. Like there wasn't, you know, some some declaration made in the 1700s. <laughs> Thou must not expand right. unless yeah. Oakland and Tampa settle their stadium situations. It's just That's fair. Them I guess saying, that. yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because now we just heard the other day that the league's concerned about the TV money, and that might hold back expansion mm-hmm. as well. So then it starts to get to all right, what's going on here behind the scenes? Because mm-hmm. as much as we're talking about this, Nashville has deserved to have a team for the past decade at least. Oh, yeah. And we totally. are missing out as a sport long-term by not having a city like that embrace Major League Baseball more. Right. Yeah, I, I do feel like baseball really wants to be in Nashville. Baseball players really want to be in Nashville. Everybody seems to want to be there, but Nashville still can't, you know, figure out a, a stadium thing there either. And that's the whole big thing, right? I mean, that's that was why it was a joke when Tampa was like, oh, we're going to play half our games in Tampa and half in Montreal in, in two new stadiums. I mean, you can't get one new stadium. How are you going to have two stadiums to new stadiums to split a team? It was that was silly. So uh, so much of this franchise relocation, as you guys know, is just posturing. And and you, from my perspective, you try to like filter out what's real and what is and, and, and put it in perspective. And that can be hard sometimes because um, they put on a hard sell. 
All right, so yeah, now let's let's swing it around a little bit. You know, looking at some of your um, recent articles with the Athletic, you wrote about Bobby Wood Jr. and the Royals and extension. So, can you give us a little more insight on how you saw all of that going down, and if you think there will be more of that, especially with teams in smaller markets to build around a player? Yeah, it seems like that's the uh, that's the trend that we're seeing um, clearly. Um, you know, is is these teams that um, can buy a couple of years on the back end of free agency by doing it before the guy even comes to the big leagues. It certainly, you know, I, I saw it years ago. I remember the Yankees were in Tampa one day and, and, and uh, uh, Evan Longoria had just come to the big leagues and he signed a long-term deal um, like his first week in the big leagues. So it's, you know, there's, there wasn't much time to, to move it up, but they've already now moved it up for my, for minor leaguers and top prospects with Chorio. We saw, um, you know, and Keith with, with, with the Tigers. So, um, I think it's 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 putting that dollar figure on um, very very young players. Corbin Carroll uh, last year uh, before his rookie season. Um, so I think that's that's the new trend, and 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 it's just a question of you know being in that position as a kid to to take the money or or try to play it out and and, and maybe make more year to year. And they don't all work out um, to be team friendly. I mean, certain guys just didn't. Scott Kingery never really. Uh, made it with the Phillies um, the way they thought he would. And John Singleton with the, with the Astros. So there is some risk for the teams, um, but I think it's become a necessary thing for these teams to do, um, and especially in Kansas city situation, right? I mean, they're trying to get a new ballpark and, and they're trying to make a good faith effort. And, and I, uh, I think it's cool what they've done. I mean, they've had a hundred $110 million for several free agents, um, which for them is pretty good. Um, you know, Seth Lugo and Michael Waka and, and so on. And then to make your big commitment to uh, to wit, even if it only is seven years, when he can opt out of it for seven years, even if it's just seven years, you're getting the first two years he already got, plus seven more years for a player whose you know speed is a big part of his game. Those are probably going to be the best nine years he has, or you know the bulk of it. So you're getting the the best years of of a player like that's career, and I think it's terrific. Why, why don't more teams do this? I know you mentioned it's kind of becoming the trend, but you still don't see a lot of teams do this. I, Obviously, I'm a White Sox kind of guy. They've never really done this that big, mm-hmm. right? They've never done a Jackson Churio, a Bobby Witt kind of deal. Yes, they have. With, with who? Aloy. Oh, not for 200. No, not those really long ones. They do the, the they shorter They do a shorter ones. one, but I'm saying like Oakland, right? When they had yeah. Chapman and they oh, had yeah. guys like that, they had Matt Olson. Why didn't they do it? Why, why you, you see certain teams, certain teams, and we had uh, – we had – who was it? I asked the other day about what, what makes a general manager offer this guy, but not this guy. Was it Dave, maybe David Stearns? I think yeah, Stearns was we, old. we asked him, right? Pete Alonzo. Pete Alonzo. Like, mm-hmm. why don't teams do this? Even like, I understand not doing it until they get to the major leagues because some guys haven't worked out. Like you mentioned, Kingery and John Singleton, there was a more to, way more to that than just right. him signing, as you know, yeah. but why don't teams do this? approach? Because I know this when I was even my second year, if teams would have come to me after, like Bobby Witt and said, hey, we'll sign you to – I mean, numbers were way different then. Five-year, $20 million, I would have been like, shit, I can't turn that down. I'm never going to make $20 million, right? right. So I, I think more players – and I know agents are smarter now and players are supposedly smarter now. But you have a hard time as a young player. A team comes to you and says, hey, here's five years, 50. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I, man I'm going to turn down $50 million? Even if your agent's mm-hmm. in your ear. So I think this would be beneficial for players and for teams to do this more, if especially once te- guys have established themselves a year or two in. Yeah, I've, I've always felt that. Like if I was in your guys' position as a player, knowing all the things that can go wrong, that you really shouldn't turn down your first fortune, right? Like once you're set and you've got a, a, a big figure, a big foundation for yourself and your family, then the next one, if you're still really great, then you can go get top dollar and, and, and break the bank. But don't turn down your first fortune. And teams are in that position to offer these guys their first fortune and see if they turn it down. The, the, I don't know why more of them don't do it, except for maybe the risk factor, I guess. But um, if these guys are as good as you say, as you think, um, then it's going to be a, value, a bargain for you. The thing that blows me away is Baltimore hasn't done any of them. you know. And, and, and I sat with John Angelos in the dugout last year in, in, in Baltimore – and obviously he's put the team for sale now um, he's, that sales in progress, but um, just to hear him talk about how, like if we start giving 200 million to this guy and a hundred million dollars, this guy, like everybody wants, we're going to be underwater so fast. And it's just like, it was hard to, hard to understand because like, 
you know, you want to keep this thing going. Obviously, you can't sign everybody. But if you're the Baltimore Orioles, you got the best core of young players right now. Like, man, just pick pick a couple of them. Make them say no. I mean, maybe it's going on behind the scenes and nobody knows about it. But I really don't think so. I mean, Adley Rushman should be signed there for a long time right now. Um, you know, let alone Henderson and, and, and some of the other guys. Um, there's no it, – it's it boggles my mind the Orioles have nobody signed up long term. Hey, big picture, offseason, Tyler – what did you like, not like? I know it's still ongoing technically, you know, from a team perspective. You want to pick out maybe one team where, besides the Dodgers, you were like, I really like their offseason. And another team on the other end? Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because there, there aren't a lot of teams that really jump out at me as saying like, oh, they've had an A-plus offseason. Um, maybe that's because the, the, the market didn't have as many big stars as, as it usually does. Um, I think certain teams did sort of the minimum that they needed to do. Um, Phillies bringing back Aaron Nola. They kind of had to do that and they did it right away, but have been very quiet since then. Um, you know, that, that stands out. I mean, I, I still don't know what the, you know, where the Cubs are going to pivot. I mean, their biggest hitter is still out there, you know, in, in Bellinger and they lost Stroman. Um, do they lose some of their momentum? Um, you know, Boston saying that they were going to go full throttle and then, once again, really not doing much. Um, just, you know, complimentary pieces here and there. Um, makes you wonder about their direction. So, uh, you know, it, it's it, the Giants, I think, have, have certainly been, been trying again. Um, you know, they, Robbie Ray, I know he's hurt right now, but, you know, that, that, that's a high upside guy. And, and, and some of the hitters they've gotten with Solaire and, uh, and, you know, and, and Lee, I think his name is. So I, I they, um, I guess I like what the Giants have done, and, and I really, you know, what else I really like is what the Diamondbacks have done, um, because they they're they're a team that, to their credit, you know, in the World Series they were one starter short. They were, you know, and and really they could have been two, but Brandon Fott really stepped up. Um, but you know, Mike Hazen said we're one we were one starter short, and that's on me. And he went out and he spent spent uh, some money, and he got Eduardo, Eduardo Rodriguez. Um, <clears throat> so I like I like Arizona doing that and kind of reinvesting in the team to try to extend what they started last year. Um, so I, 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 I like, I like what I see from them too. Okay. So I have to ask this. How many dogs do you have? Dude. Oh my God. I got four. Four. <laughs> Is there yeah. an intruder that we need to know about? Because no, they're they doing, are... they're doing the, uh, they're doing the, 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 the trash pickup right now. So they're going crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, it's, that's, I really need to get spring training to get away from the dogs, man. That's, oh, oh okay. Oh, All right. So yeah. we mentioned you recently went to the athletic over the winter and you were at New York Times for, for a long time. And I remember seeing you in New York, we'd come in or the Yankees would come into town. So is, is this a sign that someone like you who was there? I think you were over 20 years at New York Times, 20, right? That 24 years, almost 24, that, yeah. That they don't, they're kind of lo- losing sports interest because why would they let, and again, you don't have to get into all the details, but it seems odd to me. They let, let someone like you that's been there and done such a great job leave for the athletic. And if you go into, if you pick up the New York times nowadays, there's not a lot of sports coverage. Well, dude, it's crazy. Like I, I felt a little bit about how players feel sometimes when they say like, why do I have to find out through the media, through Ken Rosenthal that I've been traded or, or something like that? Because we found out from uh, a Washington post media writer last year, started calling us around and say, Hey, I'm hearing that the time is going to uh, cut the entire sports department and uh, you know outsource sports to the athletic. And this is like on a on a Friday. I'm like, why am I hearing this from another newspaper instead of you know them telling us, leveling with us about what's really going on? Um, you know, but eventually, after a crazy weekend, we were all kind of in limbo. They told us, um, you know, that, that they were that that was true that they were uh, going to eliminate the sports department as a freestanding desk and utilize the athletic for all of <clears throat> all of sports coverage. And that was really tough um, because the Times had, had a great sports tradition going back to the very beginning. Um, but it, 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 our focus at the time, sports department, had changed um, over those last few years. And I will give the company credit because they, they invested $550 million to buy the athletic. So they definitely see as a company the value in sports coverage. And that's why they bought the athletic. 
And so when the whole thing went down, I was like, that's where I need to be. You know, so I'm, I'm still under the umbrella of the corporate New York Times, but I'm with the sports people. Um, and that's, I mean, I just, I love it over there, man. I mean, the athletic just does baseball the way I think it should be covered um, in all sports, really. So it's, it's still corporate New York Times. They put the New York, they, they put the athletic stuff in print. And I think the print section now is great. Um, but it's weird, man. It's weird. For, I feel for a lot of my colleagues, you know, at the Times who stay there and they far, they're farmed out to other departments. Um, they're not writing sports anymore. It's like you kept your employment, but you lost your job. It's really weird. Yeah, and you, you ended up in the perfect spot. Exactly. Also, did you hear what he said? One of our taglines. But that, that's for writing. It? Baseball the way it should be covered. True. But he also has to work with Rosenthal, which is a problem. <laughs> well, we do too. As you know, Tyler, we work <laughs> yeah, he's with the best. Ken. He is uh, the best. All right, so let's finish with this, okay? I told the guys, I don't know if they're aware. Obviously, I know this working with you for years. You are a trivia whiz. You have many um, tricks in the trick bag, whatever. I don't know. I'm out of words today. But... Um, you are, you are one of the, the, the smartest historians in the game that I've ever been around. So we haven't done this in a while, but it used to be pretty popular. Maybe we'll bring it back during the season, but a little random immaculate grid. I know you play almost every day, so we're not going to do oh, every day. Almost. Played. Come on, man. Right. Yeah. So we picked That's a cool. random day from a while back and we're going to queue it up. Let's do it. And we're going to give it a shot. So let's run the gritty. There you go. So usually we do this with players, Tyler, and it's pretty fun and we have to help them out and the fans help them out as well. I don't think we're going to have to help you out at all. So we're basically just going to put you on the spot and we can just kind of get your reasoning as we talk through this. (laughs) But we've got the Marlins, the Brewers and 40 plus save seasons at the top. And on the left column, you've got the Red Sox and the Twins, little Fort Myers spring training connection there and Mm. all stars. So we'll give you a sec to think about it. All right. And then we do five minutes on the clock. We do have a pitch clock here because also Paul Seawald's joining us in five minutes. So mm-hmm. uh, you have five minutes. You let me know when you feel ready to start winging through it. And five minutes is plenty of time. Like you should be able to get through it in, in a few minutes. But you let me know when yeah. you're good to go. And then we will press play and you can kind of talk through your reasoning here. Uh, all right. Let's do it. Okay. Let us begin. Let's hit the clock and start Immaculate Grid for Tyler Kepner. All right, center square, I'm going to go with uh, – we have a couple catchers here, so I'm going to go with uh, Chad Moeller for Ooh. Brewers and Twins. Ex-teammate. Yeah, Chad and I did a story about all the pictures. He's caught once. It was it was great. Um, 0.07. So um, Solid. Brewers all-star. Brewers had an all-star named Danny Cop Kolbs, K-O-L-B, um, in 2004. Yeah. Dan – K-O-L-B. Dan Kolb, yeah. Yeah, um, that would Point be a good one. percentage. Incredible. He was a reliever, right? Yeah, yeah, he was a closer. Yeah. Um, yep. He came in early in that game in 04. Um, the Marlins All-Star say, ah, that only goes back to 93. Um, was Garrett Cooper an All-Star? He may have been. I'm going to go with Gabby Sanchez, though. Ooh. Um, Gabby with 1B. Bottom Marlins left All-Star. corner, Claude. Marlins All-Star. Bottom left corner, Gabby Sanchez. Um, this, is like, this is like doing a coloring... Coloring book with Bob Ross. This is awesome. This is so much fun. <laughs> I need a lot more hair for that, but yeah. One, um, one B, Claude, for Gabby. JBY. One yeah, B. Gabby Sanchez. It was in like 2012 or 10 or something. Point um, one. Hot start. Okay. Uh, Marlins, um, Marlins and the Red Sox, top left corner. Uh, a guy named Chris Hammond, a good left-hander with good changeup. I was going to go Berkey Badenhop. Mm. Oh, that'd be going too. Yeah, he was in that that uh, Cabrera trade. Um, Chris Hammond. Chris Hammond. There you go. Chris Hammond. Um, Point oh seven. <laughs> the uh, boy, there's so many Brewers, so many good Brewer, um, Brewer, Boston combos. Um, for you, not for me. <laughs> I'm like. I mean, Jackie I could Bradley's go Danny one Darwin. Danny Darwin's always good. I could go uh, Ed Travis Romero. Travis Shaw was a guy. Travis Shaw. No, that's too common. Um, yeah. Oh, there's a guy. There's a good guy. Oh, he was a he had a really good season in the early '70s. I had him in the sim team. He was a good. He was a pitcher. He was a right-hander. Um, 
God, he had like oh Ken Sanders. What's his name? Ken Sanders. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Some dude named this Ken. Dude Look him up. He had a really good year with the Brewers. Yeah, early <laughs> oh, Brewers. That's the one. Jeez. Um, Look at that. Look at this. That one. needs to be my new profile pick, please. <laughs> what does it look like, you Kratz? If you had air, yeah. yes, Bet MGM. That's my new profile pick. <laughs> that's an A on Kratz right. hats too. Yes. Miami and the Twins. Um, well, I only got two minutes left. Uh, let's do uh, my pal Jim Eisenreich in that in that one. Mm. That's going to be a little higher, but EI EI. There you go. Yeah, there it is. Ooh, oh, that one's gonna Ooh, hurt. Two percent, two percent. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. We're like, oh man, two percent. Two percent. Now, all, all right. star, forty, save, forty season. save season. Anybody who had a forty save season was an all star at any point. That's a lot. Um, <sighs> Who's the closer? Um, I always forget the closer's name from the Nats that had it. They called him Chief. Oh, Chad Cordero. Did yeah. he have 40 saves? Please I'm don't let sure me ruin had... your I, I ruined the grid. Yeah, yeah, don't don't ruin his flow, Kratz. He's got a minute uh, and a half. All right. Twins, 40 saves. Uh man, Reardon won a World Series there. Uh did he have the 40 saves for them? What about Aggie? Aguilera. Did he ever get to 40? Yeah, I'm sure he must have, yeah. Um sometimes they do 30 saves, which is a lot easier. 40. Uh Eddie Gardado, I'm sure, did. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe Nathan, obviously. Uh, all right, I'm getting down here. All right, um, let's say Jeff Reardon. Okay. Okay. Jeff Rear. R R E A. There you go. We got. We we need some quick hitters here. Right. Ooh, eleven. All right. Derek Lowe. Star. Derek Lowe. Four. Red Sox. All star forty know. saves, uh, thick pen. Let's do Bobby Thick. Thicky, my boy. Bobby. Four. Like okay. And then Boston forty saves. Uh, man, did Lee Smith get forty up there? Um, Folk. Dick Raditz. Uh, what about D'Lo? Yeah, I think he got forty. Yeah, we'll do him. Sure. Derek. Derek Lowe. Derek Lowe. At the buzzer. Red. 3%. 21, okay. 21, nice. Right. The beginning we were talking about that. Vegas. We were talking about Vegas, so 21. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, that's good. That is good. That is good. That's also, the best I've seen. Your, your first four or five picks were Jeff like Reardon crushed out him. of control. Jeff Reardon crushed him. Who's this dude? In the what did Reardon Ken get? Sanders? Ken Sanders. Ken Sanders, the legend. Yeah. Yeah, see, really most of mine are in that in that wheelhouse of of like eighties or or either the eighties or guys I covered or talked to, but yeah, Ken Sanders that just he had a good he had a real good season for the Brewers in like seventy or something like that, and uh, I don't know, he used to pitch for Boston. Oof, Weird stuff well, to remember, let's, man. Let, let's finish with this, Tyler. Just let everyone know because I forgot. W- what's your famous? Trivia savantish thing that you've got? You know, every I'm not going to make you do this. Oh right yeah, now, you can give me any guys any. Any World Series game from 1979 to now, and I can tell you who start with the starting pitchers. Every one of them. Stop. Wait, it. what? Hold on. Wait. Any from 1979 till now? Yeah. You, can you tell name me a game. Every... At game whatever in whatever World Series, I can tell game you. Game three, 2005. Game three, 2000. Oh, that was the game you hit that double the center field when Oswald was cruising, and you tied the game with that double. That was John Garland against Oswald. Yeah, he's right. Game Dude, one. He is game one, 1994. None. That's a trick ah. question. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It would have been. Uh, it would have been like uh, uh, Expos. It would have been like Kenny Hill for the Expos and uh, I don't know Jimmy Key for the Yankees, probably. Yes. Yeah. Want to do one more? Wanna By the way, Jack Cordero was 02 percent on the. Uh, Ooh. Oh game. shit! Good. Good. You got one more. Give him one more. One more. Oh, World Series. Hmm. Nineteen ninety-three. Game three. Pat Hank getting us Danny Jackson. The, the uh, Jays Phillies. won like 10 to 3. The speed there. is incredible. Paul Mahler had a home run that day. Right down the left field line off Danny Jackson. Just it was like one of the Molly. hardest things I've ever seen. Molly, right? Molitor hit it, didn't he? Yep. Yeah, he just yeah. zipped it right down the left field line. I could literally listen to Tyler just go Long year by year on World Series oh. games. It's insane. Yeah. I can't remember the anything. Vet, that place was a dump. 
Ah, uh, that was my childhood, dumb. man. That's Eric too, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, I knew every, that was a dumb first big league boy. field I ever stepped on. Yeah, dude, me too. And and I I remember well tw- once as a Phillies Phillies camp in like sixth grade, twelve years old. I remember standing at third base, and it was '87, and that was like Andre Dawson's big year. And I remember thinking, "Holy, this this is a lot closer than you think." Like, and you're a kid, you watch on TV, you think it's farther away. You get down there on a big league field, it is really close. And I remember thinking, Andre Dawson could take my head off standing, you know, 90 feet away if I'm even with a base. I just, for some reason, I had that vision in my mind. I just, this is big league baseball is a whole different animal when you're that close to it when you're a kid. I, I thought that Matt Lecroy was going to die at the vet one day. He was catching. <laughs> he and so we hot. played a day game in like August and it was mm. a bazillion. He came in. They had to like put him in like an ice bath between innings. Finally, they're like, "All right, you got to go catch," because he was he wasn't gonna make it. Wow. Uh, I interned inter- there. I interned there one summer. They had an old a whole old coach named Mage McDonald. He had been on the 1950 coaching staff, whatever. He was like 80, and it was like that Seinfeld skit with Mandelbaum, you know. And he he'd take all the interns and all like the front office guys out there to at, at lunchtime at high noon, the broiling heat, of the vet. And he would hit fungos, perfect fungos. He'd stay on the corner, three thirty, and he'd yell three seventy one, and you'd run to the three seventy one side, and he'd get it just in stride, four oh eight, and then you'd run to the four oh eight side, and you'd jump up on the fence and get it. I mean, it was like it was just great memories. But yeah, dude, being on that turf at 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 noon in the middle of July, um, that was that must have been something else because it was yeah. just for an intern in shorts, but let alone playing a big league baseball game. Great for cooking breakfast on the turf, mm-hmm. but everything else, yeah. tough, oh. tough. Tyler, great catching up with you. Good to see you. We'll see you out maybe in spring training. AJ and me are going to hit some camps, but appreciate you and, and love what you're doing with The Athletic. All right, my friends. Yeah, you guys do a great job over there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Eric, loved your book. And AJ, you're awesome on uh, on Fox. So uh, keep it up, guys. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, appreciate Tyler. you. Yep. Cheers. It's, and we'll have Paul Seawall joining us in just a sec. It's funny who said that in the chat. Grant goes, I don't even remember last year. <laughs> Seriously, I can't name. I can barely think. And I, I went 05 because I was I had to think about the starters and those, and I played that one. Tyler is a savant on Seriously. certain trivia. That's why I was I couldn't even say the words. I was like, oh, he's got tricks in his tricks bag. But he's, <laughs> he's got tricky next tricks. Level. <laughs> he's tricky. Tricky tricksman. Um, anyway, we'll talk to Paul Sebald in a sec. And then later on we'll get to the words from Alex Cora about being a little non-committal beyond this year. So he look on. forward to that coming up in a little bit. And also it seems like the Padres are hinting at some more movement, maybe some more outfielders. So we'll get to that as well. But we got to have three to play. Hinting we at it. We need three. Yeah. I did like Schilt's comment though. So I can't wait till we get to that. Yes. We're going to get to that. I just want to hold off because I want to see if we can bring Paul in. We usually do pretty quickly, but I'm trying to remember also the last time we spoke to Paul. We caught him once. He was post one World last Series. child, that's for sure. How many has he had since? Four? Since the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. Man, the World Series, a lot happens, but you only can get normally one child out at a time. Yeah. Well, I know. That's not true. I, I mean, get it. I get it. Yeah. As I was What's, what was that show? John and Kate plus eight? Oh. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. On that note, Oof. Paul's ready. So, Paul Seewald joining us right now on FT Live. Back at it. Paul, congratulations. Give us the lowdown, Daddy-O. Yeah, just, uh, just one, not eight. Uh, so, we're doing good. <laughs> we're doing good. Uh, Mom and baby are doing great and healthy, and, and we're, just, we're just so blessed and thankful, and our family is, uh, is doing well. We like, to, we like to say surviving, maybe not thriving these last three weeks, but we're doing great. Good. By the way, dude. We always make fun of people like, yeah. if you don't look like you're in prison right now with yeah. your like prison issued white t-shirt, I mean, there's never been an interview that looks more like, like you turn on like, what's the show, Dateline, where they're interviewing the guy in prison? <laughs> yeah. Like that is you right now with your white shirt on, the brown wall, and you're like, look at when's the guard going to come get me? So hey, did you blast murder music, that person? They're blasting <laughs> music all over this place, so I had to make sure that I got in a, I got in a room that wasn't going to be bumping whatever music was going on in the gym, and so uh, this is what you get. I apologize. I appreciate that. <laughs> Plus, the white shirt is to celebrate the new uniform. So what do you think? You're one of our first on the scene. There's been That's a, a Diamondbacks, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> 
Just with a very tiny A right in the center is all you get. <laughs> um, they seem fine. They seem fine. I probably would have made the letters on our names maybe a little bit bigger so you could tell who was actually playing. Uh, but the uniform seem fine. I'm not like I'm not super picky about my uniform. Uh, I'm a pitcher, so it's kind of like I don't look good in the uniform anyway. But I just go out there and and play, and um, we'll leave we'll leave the position players up to that and, and making sure that they look good in them. Do they fit? I mean, do they? Because we were talking about you know maybe there's some custom issues. You said you don't customize it too much, but do they fit different? Are they uncomfortable? Which is the biggest the biggest yeah. problem. They felt just fine for me today. Uh, we had our first first day of camp today for practice was, you know, not a big deal. I kind of felt like I could throw a ball in them, and that's really all I need. I, I thought the I thought the fitting was fine. I know some people, you know, they're trying to fix the pants. Pants is kind of what most people have the most problem with. And, you know, when you guys played, you kind of wanted bigger pants, and I still kind of have the bigger pants. But now these Gen Zers want to make sure that they have their tight pants, and maybe the tight pants aren't as tight as they need them, I guess. <laughs> By the way, those hats are fire. Those yeah, hats are nice. Those like blue, whatever color those things are. Yeah, our teal. Those are our nice. teal pops. Yeah. It looks, it looks good. I think everybody looked really good today at camp. I thought it was a good deal. I need you have that, and then our uh, our spring train or not a spring training, but our BP hats this year are fire too. They did a good job on those. Really, those mat. Those are like those are one of the best uniform combos with the black and the teal. In the what is it Sedona red is that what they call it out there? No, we switched from Sedona red. Yeah, I don't. Changed. I don't have the special name now. I will get the special Ooh. name for you before opening day. But we're not Sedona red anymore. We switched it. Okay, because those things are sweet. Yeah, if I was a Diamondbacks good. fan, I'd definitely have one of those. Mm -hmm. Those good. hats are one of the. Those are some of the best hats I've ever seen yeah. in baseball. Yeah, yeah. The uniqueness, the logo. Those are going to sell like crazy. Yeah, the snake logo is sick, and then you get the teal, the pop with everything. It's and it's good because everyone still has their purple. Like, all the good fans have their, their old purple stuff. So you can wear with your purple. You can wear with the new. Like, they're dynamite. I love it. Do you guys have some swag coming off the season that you just had? I know you didn't win, but the expectations for the Diamondbacks were not a couple wins away from being the best team in baseball. So you guys entering camp, coming off a pretty nice offseason, too, from the front office, being like, Hey, how we doing? Now we're real. I think a lot of credit to Mike and the group for for improving our team a lot without going crazy. I think that's you didn't want to you didn't, we didn't need a full new team. We just needed a couple of uh, pieces to really get back to that point where hey, we can win 88, 90 games, get back to the postseason and and if we reach our peak in October, we shown that we're as good as anybody in the league. So I think he did a great job of making sure that whatever little holes we did have, and we did have some holes. We only won 84 games last year, but we had some holes and he fixed them. And I think I think we, you know, we feel like we're a quality team that has a really good chance of going to the postseason. And and um, you know, that expectations word gets thrown around a lot and and that's dangerous, especially uh in spring training in April and May. But I think um personal expectations, I think I think we should feel that we are we're gonna be a postseason team. And and if we're not, that would be kind of a letdown. How do, how do you guys go about it? Do you guys already have your your meeting with pitchers and catchers where it's like, hey, guys, this is our expectation? Or is it something that Tori's like, eh, I'll just I'll, – I'll talk to you guys once once everybody gets here? Yeah, our, our meeting today was pretty quick. I think Tori wants to make sure that he gives, you know, the go-to speech when we have everybody here. It was just pitchers and catchers, a couple of position players sprinkled in. But you want to make sure you get the whole group and – um, it's going to be Tori's job, but it's also going to be some of the veterans' jobs to just make sure, um, you know, that we're not complacent. I, you know, where I was just talking about it, that I was on a team last year that had very high expectations and was coming off a successful season. And, and, you know, there was complacency a little bit in camp, like, oh, it's just camp, or then it's just April, and then it's just May. And next thing you know, on July 31st, you're out of the playoff race and you trade people. And that's, you know, that's a dangerous place that if we think about being – the National League champs, that's where we're going to be again this year. So we need to make sure that we're not complacent. And, you know, we're here to have fun in spring training. We're here to get healthy and get better and get ready for the season. But, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're trending into March 28th. And, and March 28th, it is officially go time. What kind of what kind of manager is Tori? You, you played for him last year. Obviously, you guys went to the World Series. But is he a, is he a yeller and a screamer? Is he a rah-rah? Like when he gives his speech or he gives his meetings, is he like a flip over the tape? Because I played for him. He was a – he was a coach with the Red Sox, and, he, you know, he was Mr. Friendly, Mr. I want to be everybody's pal, and manager it changes. So is he like a table flipper, or is he like the calming presence? 
So you know him that he hasn't changed since his Boston days. From what I've heard about who he was in Boston, he's still you know the UCLA Southern California beach cool guy that takes everything uh, relaxed. I think he gave us. I think we had well we won three playoff series, so I think we had four speeches while I was there. Uh, we lost the first nine games once I came over, and he had a speech that was a "you better fucking lock it in" type of thing. And then and then we locked it in. Played a lot better, and then his rah rah speeches for uh, winning all those series were mostly just let's have some fun tonight. So that's just who Tori is. He's very calm, and I think that was huge for a lot of guys who had never been to the postseason. To have a calming influence from him was important. That Tori's not panicking, our pitching coaches, our hitting coaches are not panicking. We're not going to panic, and I think that's why we were able to play, you know, calm and, and relaxed, and we had no pressure, and we went out there and played that way. I was in your I was in your role back in 2014. Difference was I never played. You got in games, <laughs> but I was traded midseason from a good team that was just outside of the playoffs to another good team that was just outside of the playoffs and lost in the World Series. So I know what it's like to be in spring training wanting to win the World Series in the next year. We ended up winning the World Series in 15. What do you guys need to do? What do you guys need to do? You said, ah, you know, we had a few holes here and there, but what specifically to win the World Series? Not just make the playoffs, win the World Series. Yeah, it, we need to get to the playoffs before we win the, win the World okay, Series. Okay, fair. So our, fair. Our, our goal is to make sure that we are one of the six teams that gets to play in a playoff series. And if we are, if we do the things that we know we can do by throwing strikes as a, as a pitching staff, our defense is fantastic. Letting our great defensive unit work and our at-bats just be quality at-bats and create chaos on the bases. That's how we are going to – we're going to win enough games that we're going to be one of those six teams. And that's what that's what we need to do. We need to make sure our pitching staff is throwing strikes, letting our great defensive unit work, and our offense just get on base and create create havoc on the bases. That's that's what the Arizona Diamondbacks do. We embrace chaos was our, was our term in the postseason last year and, and – we just need to do that again. That's that's our key. And you needed pop, and you guys got pop, which yeah. I'm in, a the big fan of, in the postseason, in the postseason, it's about taking one swing and scoring. It all it it it's been like that since the beginning of baseball, and it won't change. That's not who we are for 162, but we got it when we needed it. That's how we'll win the World Series again: is getting on base and creating a lot of runs, and then every once in a while, somebody's going to hit a three-run homer, and that's how we're going to win. Gino Suarez helps. Jack Peterson helps. I like some of those big boy bats. Those guys pickups. hit homers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know, you played with Gino, so you see him coming through. What uh, do you I think know. of that move? I don't know if we had talked about it prior, but what did you think of that move? Because he's a great teammate. He's got pop. I think he was a little disappointed in the swing and miss last year, and he spoke publicly about how he's trying to work on that. I don't know how you do, but I, I believe in him. So what did you think of that move? So it was great. So, uh, you know, I I get a call. I, I see that I have a missed call from Mike Hazen uh, this offseason. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, you got to call the GM back immediately. So I call him back and he's like, you're not getting traded. I promise you're not getting traded. I need to talk to you. I was like, okay. Okay. I figured you weren't trading me two months after getting me, but I, I appreciate that. So he says, Tell, talk to me about Gino Suarez. And if he would have been able to see my face, my face lights up, obviously. Anyone who's ever met Gino knows that he's one of the best teammates anybody could possibly ask for. And so I just told him he's, you know, he's an incredible guy who's going to help our team dramatically. And, you know, whatever you need to give up to get him will make our team better. And I'm just so excited that I get to be Gino's teammate again and we get good vibes back here. And, um, yeah, that I, I know he was disappointed a little bit in his season last year, but Gino's – Gino does not stop working to make himself better, even after contract after contract. And so that's why I know if he's concerned about it, he's going to be he's it's going to be better this year, and we're going to get the best version of Gino Suarez possible. And that's going to be a huge, huge help to to the middle of our lineup and, and to the left side of our infield. Live BP start real soon here. Who are you most excited to give like some just step on one and punch them out in a live BP? I'm so bad at live BPs. I got absolutely hit around the last couple of years of lives. It's uh, so I need I need to try and I need to try and step on the gas and see what I got. But I, I was getting hit pretty hard last year, and um, I just think it's so funny in Seattle. They you know the, all the coaching staff gets with all the catchers, and the catchers you know kind of explain like here I caught 
you know, I caught this guy, this guy, this guy, here's what I saw. And I got, I had a double A catcher last year who caught me in a live VP that I got, you know, Cal took me up top. A couple people took me up top, just bad. He goes on the meeting like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say, but like Paul doesn't look good. We might, <laughs> you know, we need, he doesn't look good. And apparently Scott, Scott service was like, it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just go to the next guy. Like, don't sweat it. <laughs> Don't sweat it. But I, he told me that story and I was like, yeah, that, that was a bad day. I, I don't blame him for saying that was a bad day, but uh, yeah. So live BPs and I, well, I'm not great at them. So we're going to, you know, we're going to make sure we get through them and we're going to throw in eight games this spring and, and we're going to be ready March 28th, but I'm not a live VP standout by any means. That's, <laughs> that's hilarious because I've been in that situation. You're like, you're, you're clearly not, the, this catcher was clearly not making the team. <laughs> no. You were, you know, you were one of the uh, all-star bullpen pieces that's in the back end. Of, and it's like, I, I want to be honest, like, it's kind of yeah. my reputation here, but he looked terrible. He didn't throw <laughs> any he, – everything he threw over the plate got whacked. The story, I guess he he really was like, I don't want to say this about Paul, but, like, I have to say he he doesn't look very good. Like, I've never caught him before. He doesn't look very good to me. You should have, you should have, you you should have found out about it and gone up to him over on the minor league side and be like, "Yo, bro, you serious, dude? Throw me you under sold the bus? me out, you sold me out to the coaching staff like that? Yeah. I'm trying to get an extension, and you're over here now. I'm probably gonna get traded. Hey, look what happened in July. You got traded. <laughs> yes, that would have been. I, you know that that bubble of like, hey, it's my first spring training. To scare a kid like that would have been tough, but that would have been that would have been pretty good. I don't like that. <laughs> That would have been. Hey, classic. we had there like there's some dudes that take it way serious. Yeah, like the 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 pitchers BP. Like I was awful at it. I broke bad after bad. And there's some guys that don't swing. They're like, oh, I'm That's just tracking tired. pitches. They just watch the ball go. And I'm like, dude, right? It's the worst as a catcher. That's like you get your ass kicked. And then then one time, Paul, we had El Duque. We had El Duque in 2005. Okay. We had this young kid named Casey Rogowski, and he was like an all state wrestler oh, yeah. from like Michigan. He was like a three-time state heavyweight champion wrestler guy, monster. You know, Duque is just out there kind of lobbing it, and he, he's like, you know, they're telling you what's coming. And El Duque didn't want the L screen, and we're like, dude, you better put the L screen up there. And he's like, no. First, and, and Casey hits one. <laughs> and, you know, because these young kids get up there, and this is like their shot, man. This yep, is like right. I'm showing these big league dudes what's up. And El Duque got pissed and, like, charged him. And we're like, hey, man, you don't want to charge him, dude. He will whoop your ass. He will, like, tie you up in a pretzel. El Duque's like, hey, you don't hit – you don't – you apologize when you hit it at me. In case you – you know, this kid's hey, like, he's like, I didn't know what to do. You he's said like, it. What? These guys – guys coming into camp, they're trying to show what they can do. I've been on that side. That's – you know, you come in game ready and you got to show what you can do. That's your best chance, especially, you know, you face the team's closer and you take them up top or you hit a line drive back at them, you know. That looks pretty good, but uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I'm not very good at live VPs, and and we'll see how they go. But what I'll, about when I'll you get go down to the minor and, and leagues? What about like that? when they are like? What about when they tell you, "Hey, you're gonna we're facing the Rangers today. We don't want them to see you," you know? <laughs> and you're like, "Hey, go pitch against the A ball team on field 37 over there," and you just go down there, and guys are like, "Piss rod, Woo, Palmer, missile." And you go, I faced seven hitters and I hit, gave up six doubles and a homer. <laughs> and they walked, they rolled me over. Man, I'm glad I roll, did that. Roll it and you just walk oh, off yeah. after a double. There's <laughs> nothing worse. Absolutely <laughs> nothing worse. No, there's no way I could get out to an A-ball. I would get absolutely ripped in A-ball. I had, they'd have no plan. And so I would have no plan and just throw in my set. Like, I would just, there's no way I could get out of the Florida State League anymore. Oh, man. <laughs> I did. It's crazy. We'd send our best guys down there and they would just get whacked. Wow. Whack, and you're like, damn, because they come in like I'm gonna work on fastball control. And these dudes, no. again, this is they're like, this is my shot, man. I'm facing Paul Seawald. <laughs> Everyone's watching the GM, the pitch big league. Watch this, and whack, whack. And I mean, these other teams get excited to face. You know, yeah, man, it's, and then it as the they always send a catcher with you. So I was always, I'd always get sent over there too. <laughs> and my ears were ring. I'm like, ah, so like, much noise man. in these loud cont- Oh man, yeah. it was the worst. It was the worst. Yeah, that's a, it's a tough, it's. It's a tough situation when you're trying to come into spring training and you're trying to work on something and you can't get, you know, you can't get more than two pitches in because the minor guys are swinging at the first pitch. You're like, well, I can't set them up to get to any pitches because I only, I faced seven guys and threw nine pitches. <laughs> hey, Paul, do you have anything new up your sleeve? 
new pitch, anything you tweaked in the off season, you know, this is that time of year where pitchers are like, oh, I got something special. Actually, Kodai Senga today said he's got something new, but he doesn't want to tell anyone yet what it is, but you'll see it soon. What are you pointing to? Knuckleball. Knuckleball. Knuckle- no, no knuckleball. Uh, my knuckleball is trash. Have to have to end every game of catch with it, but it's it's not very good. So probably not going to go with that. It's not Kirby's, <laughs> you know, last game of the season knuckleball that he threw to Seager, which is great. Mm. Um, we'll see, Scott. We'll see. Um, we have a little trick, I guess. I guess I'm going to say what I'm going to say what Kodai said, and I'm going to throw I'm going to throw a couple of things in the games, and we'll see what happens. And uh, it's just one of those things. It's you know, it's a great opportunity to try and work on things. You know, we talk about going down to a minor league game, but in a in a real setting, it's it's great to throw, you know, live three live BPs in eight games and say like, does this work? Does it not work? Is this something that would work in a major league game? Is this something that, you know, is okay? But you don't need okay. You need great. So, um, we do have something that I'm going to work on, and, and we'll see. It, ghost it, fork? I have. Can we no say ghost, ghost fork? fork? I don't have. I don't no. have. I don't have hands to get my hand my fingers totally around the ball like that. Uh, <laughs> But a little change of a change of pace pitch might be might be a good Ooh. thing for me. I remember Craig Kimbrell tried that, and when he the one uh, we had him in spring with the Braves before they traded him to San Diego, he's like, "I'm gonna." Th-. We went out, and he goes, "I'm gonna throw changeups," and he got crushed. He's like, <laughs> "Yep, that's why I don't throw changeups." He went right back to two pitches. <laughs> hey, if that if that's what happens in camp, then totally good with me. Just scratch it, no big deal. We'll just go. We'll go back to work. But um, you know. If you're not getting better in this league, you're going to get passed up and you're going to get hit. And so, if I can give something, if I can give a new look to somebody, then then great. If uh, if a changeup's not my thing, then you know, we'll, the fastball and the slider have been working pretty well. But I just don't want to be. I never want to be complacent. Never want to feel like I'm not trying to get better and trying to come up with something new. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how camp goes. Maybe it's good enough to start throwing in real games. Maybe if you don't watch a Diamondback spring training game, you'll never see it again. We'll see. What? So now I'm thinking because it's a changeup. Sorry, we we totally blew your blew your cover. But from your arm angle and your release, analytically, do they look at it and say, "Ah, dude, like you're gonna really push this thing, which is gonna make it flatten out and cut a lot"? Or is there something different that they work on? This might be just nerding out pitching style, but yeah. So for two things, two one is obviously the results of it. You know. Doesn't matter if the analytics say this pitch is good, and then, like you said, every single guy is just hitting a laser in the gap. Like I'm telling you, the pitch isn't good. Like <laughs> I'm backing up bases every time I have to throw it. It's not a good pitch. Two would be would be the analytics on the movement profile on that pitch. How much is it dropping? How much is it running? Uh, am I getting carry on it instead of drop because you know I throw from down low and try to get everything to go up? These are the things that, you know, every time I throw it, I want to look at like, hey, did that get drop or did it kind of just run? Um, you guys were hitters. You saw you saw change ups. Once they just run, you guys can keep your barrel on. If it has depth to it, that tends to get people out. That's where I'm going to have to throw the pitch, go back and look at the video, go back and look at the numbers, try and figure out like, OK, the result wasn't great, but like the pitch was really good. That is what I'm looking for. Or, you know. I got him out, which is important, but like, that's just not, it just doesn't move nearly enough for me to throw it against, you know, the best in the world. So a a little bit of both. I want to see some, I want to see at least a little bit of results, but also I want to see, Hey, is this, is this doing what, you know, our goal is of trying to have a change up that, you know, is a plus pitch. Hey, Paul, what do you know about the, uh, Phantom IL because Billy Epler got suspended for it. And our guys are like, please, that's such eyewash. And he was the only yeah. one that was in on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's not the only GM I've ever worked on that got that sent somebody to the Phantom IL. It's disappointing mm-hmm. that he is caught for that. And uh, yeah, what a weird situation that, you know, I guess from a, a perspective, I almost didn't even realize that anybody even looked at that or worried about it. It's like everyone gets put on the Phantom IL. Like everyone has seen that before. Uh, if you have options, you get optioned. If you don't have options, you get put on the Phantom IL at some point. That's just the way it has always worked. Eric and AJ played before me, but I'm sure they know the same thing. Like it's just, and sometimes it's just, that's all guys need. It's just like, hey man, like just take ten days off and just try and get back at it. And then they just they click right away. It's just as hey, you need a mental break. You know, in other jobs you can take a you know you can take a vacation for a week and then you come back and you can get back to your job and get back at it. We don't have that, you know, we don't have that luxury, but 
you know, mentally, maybe that's exactly what people need. And, and if we're going to get, you know, nitpicking on this, that's, uh, it, you know, Billy shouldn't be the only guy if, if we're going to start really looking at that. Agreed. As someone that was on the Phantom IL my last year, trust me, it's, uh, it's an interesting. Kratz, Kratz was on it his whole career as he said, but uh, <laughs> it's true. All right. <laughs> so we had uh, your old teammate, Robbie Ray, on uh, recently, and I asked him about the home run he gave up to Jordan Alvarez and, and he, the way he dealt with it and, and what people said to him after the game. Because I, found, I find it interesting when guys give up monumental home runs or strike out in big situations or even get the big hit, what people say to him. And he, he, he was, like, great about it. He gave us a great answer. But the thing – we're going to run the sound for you. I don't know if you saw this or not, but I, I want you to hear what he said. So if we can run the sound for Paul, it would be great. I don't think they were. I mean, for me, um, you know, that was a that was a tough situation because I'd never been in a situation where you, we were walking off the mound and the game's over. And um, it took me a little while to process that, but I had guys around me like Eric Swanson and, and Paul Seawald and those guys that, that kind of helped me walk through those emotions and uh, really, really process that. And those, those guys were super instrumental and, in, in, you know, like – me understanding the mental side of of that happening because uh, I had never been in that situation before in my entire career so it was it was definitely tough for me but I definitely don't think that that played into the injury uh, going into the next year so first of all bravo to you for for being there for him and second of all I, I we didn't get to ask him this but why was he in the bullpen that year I don't even know why he pitched in that situation because he hadn't done it all year. He hadn't done it in years, and he won the Cy Young the year before. Yeah, um, yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, that's probably the worst. That's probably the worst I've ever felt off a baseball field was was that night. I, you know, I, I did. I follow foul territory with everything, so I did see, and and you know, a lot of people tagged me in it, so I did get to see what he said, and yeah, I just I just needed to tell him like, hey, man, like I am the closer. Like when they send me out, the game is supposed to either be over and we win or over and we lose. Like that's the only thing that we needed to think about. And, and it's disappointing that I didn't do my job. And then we had to bring him in to try and get me out of it. And it didn't work out for any of us. And, and so I just, you know, after I took some time to process it as well, we talked about it a little bit at the hotel. Um, and just, I just tried to explain to him, like, Hey man, like, I know you're going to feel like you blew it, but you didn't like, I, I am the closer with a two run lead and I let two people get on base. Like that's, that's where, you know, I just wanted Robbie to know that, um, that I took, I, I tried to take every bit of responsibility for that instead of him. And, uh, Robbie was in the bullpen. It just was kind of a weird situation. So in the bullpen or in the playoffs, you know, you don't have five starters and, and Castillo was obviously going to be our number one, no matter what. And, and Robbie had not had a ton of success against the Astros that year. And so, they weren't sure that they were going to start him in a game and, and, but they did have spots where we thought that he would be great in. Um, he had acquired that little, that sinker really that year. And, and um, Jordan, that was the only, I mean, Jordan hits everything, but the one he hits the least is a left-handed sinker on left-handed Jordan. And uh, that was the thought process behind it. And it, it, it just unfortunately didn't work out for any of us. Well, I give you major props for, for that and for what you said. And the way not only you handled it, the way he handled it when you know when it was brought up to him the other day. So yeah. way to go to, to you and way to go to him. Sorry, I know it's a tough situation. Sucks because listen, we've all been walked off. It, it's it, it sucks. It sucks. And yeah. so the way they handled it, I, I as a former player, former catcher, former teammate, I, I I'm giving you a lot of kudos for what the way you did it. Well, I, I appreciate that. You you've been there, AJ. You know it's you know when you throw a ball or when you call a pitch and then it gets you know it hits off the bat and and then you walk off. There's a uh, there's not a worse feeling. It, it, it sucks. So, um, and like he said, he's never, you know, he's not a reliever. He doesn't, he's not supposed to even know what that feels like. That's not supposed to be his responsibility. That was supposed to be mine. And, um, you know, Jordan could have done the exact same thing to me and, and it would have been totally my fault. It just, you know, circumstances worked out the way they did and it didn't work out for the Mariners that day, unfortunately. Now I got traded. So let's finish with that because you know how Robbie is. I mean, he's, he's great. He's very intellectual, but you know, more, like low key in terms of how he talks about things. So he did say in his own words, why are we trading Seawald in a playoff chase? Why are we trading Graveman in a playoff chase? Now they traded him. I know he's hurt right now and he's going to come back eventually, but there were a few Mariners pitchers that were like, damn, 
that was my guy. So yeah. uh, what did you think of that move? No, I, I mean, I've said this before, and, and I think we really, really missed Robbie last year. Not, not only going out there every fifth day and pitching, we missed him. We missed him. We missed his leadership with our young starters. Um, you know, Castillo, that's not, that's not him. That's not who he is. He goes about his job and no one's more prepared, but he's not going to make sure that everybody else is. And, you know, we had, we just had some young guys. We have Bryce, we have Brian who, you know, were rookies. They had never pitched in the major leagues. You have Logan and, and George who are still young. They are, you know, they're mature for their age, but they, you know, they're not veterans and they don't know everything about how to make sure you get everybody settled. And, and, you know, we just, we missed Robbie's influence on the group there. Um, you know, Marco goes down. It just, it just felt like, we lacked a little bit of leadership, making sure that everything was was settled, and and you know then I got traded, and and you know then it kind of felt like they had a little bit less, and you know I know lots of people will point to the fact that they had a great August after I got traded, and that's absolutely true, and and that was fantastic, but they had a poor September, and that's you know that's part of the reason I think when I left that things didn't go really the way they had hoped in September was because I left. Now August was fine, and they played some teams that weren't as good and and beat up on them, and didn't need a closer and that's fine. And, but when it came down to it, it really felt like they needed, they would have, they certainly would have liked to have Robbie and I there for, for a little bit in September. Yeah, you're right. They missed you guys in some close games. Yeah. So. But you guys try to win a hundred percent of the time. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> <Not 54. laughs> we that's are, true. yeah, we are trying to win 162 games. We're probably not going to, but that is our goal. That is our yes. goal. If you do that, it would be a record. I promise you. <laughs> I, it would be, it would It'd be. be really cool too. But they're trying to win every day. That's that's yeah. really all all we're asking for as baseball fans. So, Paul, great yeah. to see you, dude, as always. Um, enjoy camp, and we'll catch up with you in a few weeks. So good to see you guys. Yeah, we'll talk uh, either before or right about opening day. It should be fun. We'll be uh, – Yeah. I'll have a lot more sleep, you know, six weeks from now after, <laughs> after and then uh, I'll be even more excited about spring tra- – or about uh, opening day by then. Yeah, and you're a vet, so we'll get all the good scouting reports on the young guys, the whole deal. So um, study up, and, you and we'll quiz you next time. And you don't need Perfect. to move. Yes. Oh, yes. my gosh, the greatest thing of all time. What a gift. Man, we are we moved in yesterday and today, and, and we're moved in, especially when you have the two cribs and the two everythings. It's like, man, I'm so glad. What a life changer. Thank you, Arizona. I, I, call, <laughs> that, I call that the Aaron, the Aaron Hill housing. Aaron Hill played for the Diamondbacks forever, and I just thought it because we came up together, and I was like, I just always was so enamored with that. Like, bro, you don't have to move. He's like, yeah, I build a house here. I'm just here year-round. I love it. I'm like, that's amazing. So I got traded and then flew to San Francisco the next day uh, in August, and my wife, pregnant, three months pregnant, had to clean out our Seattle house and kind of fly down to Arizona and move into an Arizona house. And this is all pregnant while it's 125 degrees. And she said the other day, she's like, I would do that 11 out of 10 times over having to move in six weeks with our two girls now. So um, we're pretty excited that we are, uh, we're here for nine months now. Dude, enjoy it. Enjoy it. I love that. That's awesome. Will do. Have fun out there, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. Take it easy. You too. Cheers. Always great catching that's, up that's with so Paul. Great. You know what the best part about that was? He got traded, so he didn't have to do it. That happened to me once. It was great. When I went from Boston to St. Louis, we moved. We were moving. We when we had bought the house we're in now mm-hmm. in our old house, and and we're like, "What are we going to do?" We're like, we got to put this on the market. And some guy came to us before we even got on the market. Goes, "Hey, I want this house thirty day close cash." And we're like, "Oh yeah, awesome." Well, we were playing in the playoffs. Move to a rental house because while well, we were waiting on this house to be ready, and uh, I pull in in the Uber from the ho- from the airport after we lost in the NLCS. And I pull into the neighborhood and the guy goes, where's your house? And I go, I have no idea. He goes, you've never been to your own house? I'm like, nope. <laughs> he goes, I go, I have the address though. And he goes, which we're at a, we're at a stop sign. He goes, right or left? I go, I don't know. He goes, what does it look like? I go, never seen it. Wow. And he thought I was the craziest person. I'm like, oh, sorry, we moved and I wasn't here. <laughs> this is why, this is why <laughs> your wife should get a, absolutely mega gift today she did it's valentine's day she yeah, got me that's true <laughs> she that got not, me that is not a gift if you well, gave, if anybody else got that gift you would get that card that claudia made at the start of this show it is a great card 
And on, on that note, we have a few minutes left. Let's do that's what he said. Some topics we didn't get to. And we'll start with Alex Cora chatting with the media and just not convincing anyone that he's going to be there beyond this year. He denied to comment if he wants to continue being the Red Sox manager after this season. So he's a lame duck. And he definitely later talked about how he doesn't want to do this exact role forever. But we've heard in the past how he's interested in the front office. I don't know. I mean, well, he said he goes, he goes, I see like Larusa and Tito. I don't think I'm going to be that kind of guy. Like this sounds like a guy that wants out. Plus, I think he also understands the team ain't going to be very good. That's mm. the problem. That's the key. Now, if they were the if they were the, the Astros going to the World Series all those times or LCS Fun. all those times in a row, he might be like, yeah, I'll do this until we don't win. But he also probably looks up and is like, man, the Orioles are pretty good. The Yankees are still pretty good. Blue Jays ain't bad. The Rays are spend. always pretty good. Uh, we didn't go full throttle. We went uh, pop the clutch throttle. And, uh, yeah, so it's not me. I'm, uh, you know, I don't know. It was just weird comments because most managers are like, yeah, I want to do this as long as they'll keep me. Alex Cora was like, well, I just want to – I don't know how much longer. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> I wish he would have said, when I saw the Burns trade, that just did it for me. Between <laughs> our half-throttle offseason and the Orioles getting better and the Orioles' sale, we're fucked for the next few years. You know? Just give me the whole thing. Obviously, I'm joking. But that does suck if you're a Red Sox fan. I mean, a lot of Sox fans love Alex and – does he get won a booed? World Series with them in 2018? No, he doesn't get booed for that. Opening day, saying that he might not come back. No way. No, no he won the world. He won a World this Series with not them. Committed. He's not committed. I think Boston. he is pissed off about the roster that he's been given. Last year, there were multiple comments we would point out on this show where it kind of hinted that mm. he didn't feel like he was being given a roster to succeed with, and, and also, it felt like he was throwing it at Bloom. And now I think he might owe him a phone call. Because it's not Bloom, it's Bloom's boss. Because Breslow comes in here, he said the other day too, this is not the offseason that he anticipated, I'm paraphrasing. But we are learning for the billionth time that the GM, the president of baseball operations, only has so much power. And if you come into a job and they tell you you're going to be able to switch things up and spend, but then they say, just kidding, you're not going to have a better roster. I mean, their pitching staff looks bad compared to the rest of the division how about you know we've heard the stories that he wanted to be the gm remember that was the big thing oh alex core really wants to be the gm alex core i mean they just got a new gm and craig breslow or whatever pobo whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. but man it's like this is again this is kind of his way out right like this is oh if we don't do well well you know they you know we mutually parted ways i mean i love alex core so i hope it doesn't happen but it's just weird. Again, it's just strange. Don't you think, Kratz? Would you? Wouldn't you be like if your manager's like, I don't know if I want to do this for a long time. What do you mean? If if the manager says that, or if the team? Yeah, the man, the manager. If if they went to, let's say, when Aaron, you're playing for the Yankees and Aaron Boone, they went to Aaron Boone. And they're like, you're going to continue to do this, and he's like, so eh, as a player. Yeah, as a player, you'd no. be like, eh, I don't know. You're like, damn, dude. Like, I want to do this as long as I can. It like, doesn't. What, what? It doesn't create. Know. It doesn't create that environment like. I'm playing for this guy. We're going to be in the trenches. It doesn't go well. It's okay. It's going to turn around. No, you definitely want you want somebody that's committed. That's why you don't have lame ducks. That's usually why you don't have lame yeah. ducks. You, yeah. So Jacob said, do you think he even makes it till the end of the season? I do, because even yeah. if the Red Sox suck, it's not his fault. That's what we're talking about. This is not a roster that is fit for a postseason. Especially pitching-wise. Especially pitching -wise. It's the last place pitching staff in the division. Yeah. Period. And their offense, isn't, far. I mean, their, their offense isn't great either. I mean, no, it's good. Either. I mean, no, it's good. I mean, Devers is good. You know, can Tristan Cassis take the next step? They've got prospects I mean, coming they're gonna, too. They're going to hit. Marcelo yeah. Meyer, Kyle Teal. I don't know when they're exactly coming but up. Jaron Duran. You got to pitch. Yeah, especially in that, that ballpark's tough, man. I'm taking the over in a lot of Red Sox games this year. Same. Same. It's going to be a big target. Their, their starting rotation last year ranked piss poor in innings and in ERA. I don't think it's going to be much better. Giolito. For sale. He's going to give you mm -hmm. innings. Mm -hmm. Giolito will give you innings. See, either. today, too, Kenley's a little bit behind. They're trying to trade him. Yeah. It is it is really depressing right mm -hmm. 
Brito, Brito. Chris Martin. Brito, they got cool. Brito. <laughs> I like Chris, Chris Martin was legit like, last year. No, 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 he was, he was. I'm just saying, like, this is not a pop off the page yeah. team, let alone pitching staff. True. So we'll see what happens. All right, let's first get place. to first place. <laughs> just because right. somebody's gonna, we're gonna, somebody's gonna prove us wrong. Wait, do we have before we move on? Do we have the the Celtics tweet, or we can just say it verbally? Did you see what the Celtics tweeted Mm-mm. last night? Oh, full throttle, full throttle. No. Yes, they did. Their account. Yes. Yes, team account. <laughs> full throttle. Yes. I think it okay. had it had two of their big boys in the picture. I think I Jalen Brown was in it. Wasn't he? And, Tatum and Tatum. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Full, Full throttle. throttle. People they, lost their minds. Uh, people are going crazy on Twitter. Funny. That is first rate. Hey, teams are competitive. You know, fans only have so much income. They're choosing where they want to spend it. The Red Sox don't want to spend it on their team. The Celtics do. So fans are going that way. All right, to the Padres. So first off, AJ Preller spoke. It sounds like they're still in the market for. For outfielders, and they might even make some trades too. But also, Mike Schilt joked that he petitioned MLB to see if Tatis can play two outfield positions, but also occupy two spots in the lineup. It was rejected. If anyone can do it, it would be him. What a concept. <laughs> yeah. Well, just joking that they literally had two outfielders on their 40 man up until they signed Profar. And to be fair, Jackson Merrill, as I've mentioned multiple times, is getting a shot, but he's young. Um, he's probably going to make the team. He's almost going to have to. Well, if they don't add someone else, they might get another guy. They might get Eddie him. Rosario for a million bucks or two. Yeah, I guess. Somebody like is, that. Why, why, did they not, why did they not go get Kevin Pillar? Why, like, they needed a big White league. Star. White Star. Yeah, but go, go he, was, he just signed on Friday. He was available. Why would yeah. you not go and get a guy – like that, who is going to give you a quality, quality season in the outfield. There's other guys, too, still on the free agent market, like Michael A. Taylor, Tommy Pham types, Adam Duvall. Yeah, Tommy Pham seems like he'd be a perfect fit. He's been there. Yeah, he Schilt would knows be a him perfect from his fit. days in St. Louis. Play every day, which he always wants to do. I mean, that seems like a good fit for me. Yeah. Well, Preller basically said, we got a lot of work to do still, and they're going to okay, do by it. By the way, spring training started, guys. So I'm just saying, hey, hey, uh, Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, um, guys, uh, spring training, it it started. Trust me, they know and their agent knows. And that's the whole waiting game that you play. But there's also going to be a lot of trades in my mind over the next month or so, which is going to be a blast for players. Trades, you think? Flip flop in camps. I think so. A ton of trades will happen in spring training. Mm. I know there's not, but I think there are going to be this year because I think these players are going to sign. It's going to be lesser named guys. You think Steve gets traded? No, not now. Waiting till trade deadline. Yeah, I think you got that's an that's either a trade deadline or an off season trade. That's not a in spring training trades. Till some starter goes down for a contender and they go fuck. Let's get him. No. Which one? I don't know. I don't know who's going to get hurt. I'm not going to curse July. someone. They wait yeah. because you can still go out and sign somebody too. Don't forget. True. True. If the White Sox, if the White Sox are six games out, do they trade Dylan Cease? Oh God, yes. In a, in a, in a. Have you watched the history oh, of the gosh. White Sox? In a freaking millisecond, they'll trade them. <laughs> have you seen the history of the White Sox? They trade. They've been. They've been in first place. They're like, we're trading the team. What was it, the Black Flag sale, 93 or 95, whatever year it was? There was a year where they were like a game out and they traded everybody. I forget what year it was. I remember, but, but they got I Keith Folk it. and they got some other guys, I think, back for it. So, I mean, it was Bobby Howery, maybe. I don't know what year that was. But yeah, they did. Well, they, tra- yeah, because they know they can't win a division and they can't win a playoff series. So of course, <laughs> they're going to trade them. Well, let's talk about that division right now. So, your bet MGM division winning World Series team odds. Okay, this is interesting. So you go division by division to weigh the odds of which division will have a World Series champ. So I just thought it was interesting to see, you know, a little bit of a different slice because you can't bet on this. The NL West has the lead. So you figure Dodgers, Diamondbacks, outside chance if the Giants keep doing things. Padres, still has some I know. AL East makes sense. That's probably the battle there is the Dodgers are so heavily favored right now versus the AL East technically having 
at least three teams that can probably make a decent case for saying, hey, we could win a World Series, right? AL Central's doing work down there in the bottom, though. Plus 1,200 That's for the brutal. AL Central. It's basically just the Twins. Is there any other team that could win a World Series? I mean, even the Twins, for me, don't feel really built to win in a tournament like that. But Bullpen. if another Bullpen team started pitching, the way. they have Lopez. I mean, hmm. yeah, yeah. Hmm. They, I, they need would, another big time starter. I would save it on the Central. I'd save it. Even the NL Central to me is weak this year. I have a hard time seeing a team from the NL Central the winning the World Series. Do you see the Brewers winning the World Series with what they have running mm-hmm. out there? It's the Reds for me. You know, I like the Reds. Yeah. I think they've got I mean, the Cubs and exciting the, the young Cubs pitching. the way they're built right now. No, right? Reds are winning the division. Pirates ain't winning it. We know that. Mm-mm. I mean, Cardinals? Would you bet on the Cardinals to win? Mm-mm. Which which division? Which division do you take? If you're like, okay, because you look at what what are the Dodgers now? They're coming out at plus 320. In the plus three threes, 300 something. Yeah. So the Braves are probably at like four something. Would you buy down a little bit of that money and take the whole NL East over the NL West? Mm, You know what I mean? Like you're getting good money. You're getting good. If you're going to take the Dodgers, why not take the entire NL West? Or you don't think anybody else. Can make it from the NL West. No, the Diamondbacks have a shot. The Diamondbacks I mean, were there last year. That's a good team. They're fit that's for the modern saying. rules. Mm-hmm. Which they're, division they're do you capable. take? Usually, though, the team that loses the World Series doesn't bounce back. Right? True, true. Yeah. You're Except saying which division do you like better with a chance to win a World Series, the NL West or the NL East? If if you're going with a if you're going with a popularity pick, Braves, Phillies, Dodgers, wouldn't you just go ahead and I'm trying to pull up the you know, the, the World Series odds, Dodgers are coming out at plus 360 themselves. The Braves are coming out at plus 600. You could take the whole NL East, and now you got now you got your, your Phillies in there and the Braves, and you're getting it at plus 340. Like, I love that number. Yeah, I mean, you basically get two teams on that, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's what you're getting. You're getting the Phillies and the Braves in a little two-for-one package. Like if you yeah. think if you think if you think you're getting the most bang for your buck, you got the Mariners if they rebound, whether you think they are going to or not, the Astros and the Rangers. You take the AL West, and now you have three teams that, on paper, are gonna should be battling for three playoff spots. Mm-hmm. No, that's a good one too. I'm with you. There are three teams there, capable, right? If everything works oh. out correctly for the Mariners. I'm still worried about their offense, but. I'm with you. All right, let's keep moving here. We uh, have the bet five, get 150 instantly on the BetMGM app. Uh, You got to bet at least five bucks and you'll receive $150 instantly in additional winnings regardless of your wager's outcome. It's for new users, so download the app or hit up BetMGM.com. And when you place a wager in the amount of at least five bucks at standard odds price after you've filled up the account, you place a bet and you will receive $150 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your wager. Gambling problem or concern, call 1 800 Gambler. Right to Kratats. What are we at today? Red for love. I already wore my pink hat, so I can't. <laughs> the Phillies pee. Give it to me. Slap it to me. Tell me what you got. It's good. To be. To be. B. Yeah. The yeah. classics usually the classics. are a B. Yeah, the classics. The are classics are just Bs? I mean, yeah. For the we got to grow part. the game then. We got to sell I mean, the game. The watermelon head was, was good. I like what you guys said earlier is we need to keep thinking outside the box. And you can make some misses on city connect uniforms i like the concept that's the thing sometimes we crush them and sometimes we praise them but i like the concept that's publicity dare to be is different. Still publicity agreed and you can always kill a uniform right if one comes out and people are like this one sucks then you get rid of it some people smashed the red sox one the marathon one with the yellow which i thought was super cool and stood out and then they kept winning with it so remember they kept wearing it That was cool. I like that a lot. 
And the White Sox City Connect is better than their regular jerseys. So, yeah, but they, as we, who do we ask why they don't ever wear them? And they say because they lose all the time. The Sox do win this. They're looking in the mirror too much. Like, damn. Let, let's let's check the record. It's the, not good in them. It's the, not. I mean, the just one. in general, just across the board. Well, the whole I know. I think it was when the Russo. True. I think it was when Larusa was the manager. I asked him before a game. I said, "Why don't you guys wear those? I love those uniforms." And he goes, "We losing them, so we never wear them." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." True, true. Hey, the A Tab City connects. It says somewhere west. We're going to Oakland in a week and a half. Scroll back to the beginning of this episode if you want to see the announcement, and we'll see everyone on Thursday. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Yeah, it's a button on YouTube.